It's past Rob's bedtime. <laughs> right. Oh, it's me. It's me, isn't it? Right. Uh, so welcome, welcome, everybody, to episode uh, 20 of Heresy Hammer. Um, we have a really interesting episode uh, planned to, uh, for you guys today. Um, but more importantly, if John goes to the next slide, uh, we have a someone in the third chair because Lee isn't with us today. We have Adam. Welcome, Adam. Woo! Take um, it, you hey didn't, guys. You didn't Thanks take, for having me. You didn't take the, the long run up Adam's surname, did you, Rob? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't write that. That that, that. Adam. That's right, is, that a po- is that a Polish surname? I want to say Polish, but I don't know if it, if if that's deep. Mac- Macedonian. 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 Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Interesting. Very Alexander yeah. the Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah. Slow. <laughs> We have uh, we have uh, myself, uh, Rob. We have Adam with us today. And if you don't uh, follow Adam, you certainly will by the end of the show because we're going to have a look, um, a bit of a an Adam spotlight, an artist spotlight, uh, some of his work. Who's at Full Circle Hobby? And we also have John at D Six Miniatures. Before we get started, though, uh, we are going to have a quick thank you to our sponsors. So we have Cryptic Cabin uh, and a link for. Uh, Cryptic Cabin is below in the comments um, and make sure to order your heresy goodies from them. We have myself, Meadows Miniatures, uh, who you can book commissions through. We also have uh, Bitsmonster as well. So you can find them at www.bitsmonsters.com. Their um, their website is the best place to be able to order those bits and pieces uh, from them, whether it's your heresy sprues or heresy bits. Uh, they do free shipping from Northern Ireland, which is uh, over uh, for anything over £25, and you get 10% off your order with the code HERESYHAMMER. Uh, we also have two more. So we have Gator 3D printing, uh, some rather fine 8K 3D printing from Gator 3D. Uh, he has recently done some Pro Tools, uh, or I see, I saw some Pro Tools that he did at our last event, and they were chef kiss. They were absolutely awesome. They were amazing. Uh, but if you want some 3D printed bits, you can go to Dan, or alternatively, you could go to Beowulf Miniature Printing, who is just as good, does some fantastic stuff, and has great examples of his work and what he prints uh, online on his website. So make sure to go check it out. So thank you to those guys for their support and helping us to create the show. So speaking of shows, our 20th show is going to be all about planning and delivering for us heresy events. Now, we, I'm go- I, these guys actually haven't seen the PowerPoint. They don't know what's go- going to come. Um, so I'm going to be shooting. I mean, that's necessarily true. I have got to the PowerPoint. But <laughs> no. I have to flick through <laughs> okay. it. No. Well, Adam, Adam's no. not seen it. So um, I'm going to be shooting questions at them about um, organising events. And if you are thinking about organising an event, um, what you should consider before you do it, um, as well as that kind of a behind the scenes look at organising events. So if you are an attendee at events, what kind of happens behind the scenes and the lead? Yeah, and also right. focusing a little bit on how to be a good attendee. Like if you're if you're new. To the event right. scene you're maybe feeling a slight bit of trepidation about stepping out of your comfort zone and going to play with some new people in a new environment like what can you do to make sure that you absolutely definitely have a great weekend absolutely um cool. but before we do that we shall have a look at some of adam's work so if we head over to the next part for me john so adam now I I think it's really important to firstly say that Adam is an absolutely water, awesome uh, artist. Like your work is Thank just you, Rob. insane. Um, and I think that John would probably agree that if you want to look at some oh, amazing yes. thousand suns, if you um, want to feel inadequate in everything, <laughs> yeah. take a look at a beautiful but, man painting um, beautiful toys and just oh. think, well. Oh. Turns out I haven't been given dealt any of a nice hand at all. So, so we're gonna have a look at some of your um some of your work. So I was rifling in the past kind of hour through your Instagram. I went all the way back to 2015 and uh, we'll have a look at your uh, like the first grey nights that you posted up to what you've done recently. Um do you want yeah. to just talk about um Adam? Because I you know, those people who listen to podcasts and things like that um will have probably heard you on the Eye of Horace. Um, but you're also quite big in the painting world as well. But do you want to talk about like your background with painting and particularly with Horace Heresy? Righty, so I've been doing this hobby for about 20 years now. Uh, originally got into it through fantasy battles, like most of us did. Um, just for the painting element, really, and I like the fantastical style of, of the miniatures and whatnot, and one thing led to another, and then I sort of started playing 
40k with a gaming group um mm. and then and then after that became a regular attend uh, sorry event attendee mm. um and once the kind of golden era of 40k fifth edition finished and, and diminished um a yeah. lot of that love for the game kind of wore off mm. um and that's where i found my sort of new love in in heresy and haven't really looked back since yeah so you must have been right in from the start now your kind of your was your first army ultramarines was it for heresy yeah it was. yeah yeah okay and tell us a bit about those now you we can actually see that um force can't we um on SNN battle reports, because I think that they've uh, they've managed to get their their hands on that army. But um, tell us a bit about that force and kind of what your rationale behind that force was. I think um, in the early days of starting Heresy, I just wanted to paint and collect units that looked cool, mm -hmm. and then um, you know you get the bug and and the addiction is real. So. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden you've, you've got three, four, five, six thousand points of, of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and really it was just based upon, um, what I liked the look of at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there wasn't too many heresy, uh, events around at that time either. Right. So it was more about, uh, a, a collection of stuff really. Yeah. Um, before, but yeah, so the, the, like the list wasn't too like, um, synergize or optimize or, or anything um by that regard which is probably why i don't have any of the old trains legion specific mm -hmm. units in that force mm -hmm. um and then once i sort of developed a new army idea and collecting new and different things um i kind of sold the ultras off and and uh yeah moved on yeah well i mean we've all been there and and how about your <laughs> yeah. your oh, yeah. your your painting so i mean i you started posting, I mean, this is a good example, right, of um, some grey knights. I assume in 5th edition that you painted this was the first thing in Instagram that you posted. Um, and then we got some really kind of relatively recent work. Although you, you post fairly infrequently, but I think it's mainly because you're a very busy man. But um, talk about your development of painting uh, between, like, 2015 and now you know do you, did you work on it really hard to improve your painting was it just something that is natural for you um did you you know study art prior to getting into warhammer uh yeah that's a good question actually I, i'm I, well in my past life I, i'm i was a graphic designer by trade mm -hmm. so um i've always kind of studied fine art and mm -hmm. and sort of like the elements and the principles behind art mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but i think um you can apply that theory and it's, and it's quite valuable theory to model painting and to, and to our hobby. Mm -hmm. Um, however, but in terms of my style, um, mm -hmm. I think that I just followed the traditional clean cut heavy metal sort of style mm -hmm. when I, when I started and I was really inspired by, um, those classic sort of GW artists like Martin Footit, Brian Nelson, um, Seb Herbert, Mm. uh all, all those og guys right yeah that did like spectacular conversions that you didn't really recognize them as conversions and mm. terrific clean paint jobs that just encapsulated the setting so well yeah so um i think yeah through my development of of my style especially in the early days i was quite a butterfly style mm. of hobbyist i mm. do you know two squads from this force and then paint a character out of that army yeah. and then not really have anything kind of substantial to play with outside of my 1500 point or 2000 point chaos space marine army that i was yeah. walking around at the time yeah um but i think what that did do was expose me to a lot of different models and surfaces to paint and different um techniques and ways of highlighting and painting fabrics on one and muscle tone on another and then armor on a third so i think i got a breadth of exposure through my mm. early time mm. in the hobby mm -hmm. before i kind of I've, you know you, you kind of have, have these moments of self-reflection in your own hobby every sort of couple of years yeah and um and i remember sort of definitively choosing okay i think this is what i want to do with my hobby i want a, a really nice collection that i'm proud of um I love yeah. space marines. I've always painted space marines. So that's what I kind of just focused in on. And 
like, yeah, my, I guess my Instagram is not really a, a full representation of all the stuff I've painted, you know? Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and to most people, it kind of looks, it looks probably a little bit boring because it's all like candy red, right? There's not much <laughs> variety to it at all. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, uh, so I know that you've got a, bro- a bigger body of work than the, um, than what is on your Instagram. So, I mean, I would actively encourage you to start posting regularly. I know that's not always easy. I don't think I could easy. cope. I, um, I don't think my inferiority complex has gone. <laughs> with that. Constantly seeing all your fucking thousand sons, to be honest. Christ. Um, I, yeah, I don't I suppose... blame people for being bored out of their minds. <laughs> <laughs> we can't all be batch painting sanguineuses, Adam. Let's be honest. No, well, no, exactly. Exactly right. My, other, my next um, yes. uh, question as well, Adam, is so um, have you entered any competitions or Golden Demons? Um uh, I mean, there used to be, I think, a golden demon in, in Australia, didn't there? But I'm not sure the, the, that it comes as far as Oz now. But, um, you know, uh, have you ever been a competition painter at all? Um, yeah, in short. Um, there was, once upon a time, golden demon here in Australia. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I was still I was still a bit of a young pup. Um, so I did enter, enter the young bloods category for a couple of years and, and walked away with trophies in both of those years um and then and then gd went extinct really yeah. um yeah. and and hasn't hasn't been back since yeah not um, not, not not worth a plane ticket to uh chicago or or um manchester or birmingham to just to to do a golden demon i guess but um yeah well impressive I don't, I don't impressive to. I young think a, a hobby sabbatical will be on the cards yeah yeah and then my kind of final question i I might ask john if he's got any questions for you as well but um i think the other thing um about your painting which i have always really loved um and i'm sure john john will agree with me here is that um you really lean into true metallic metals right i mean i have no doubt you can probably Mm. do non metallic metals but um the magnus and it's definitely worth checking out adam's instagram if you've not um if you've not seen it but the 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 tones and the as you say like the textures the freehand on that Magnus but also it's a it's a it's a true metallic metal version of Magnus which you have I have seen many of them before but often the very very high standard ones are non-metallic metal you know you think of Andy's one or you think of the Forge yeah. box art um, but yours is just as good but it's true metallic metals and and yeah I mean what's your you know have you consider doing much non-metallic metal you know why why do you like tr- i mean i really like true metallic metal but what's your thoughts on on doing it i really like true metallic metal too i think i've got um a bit of a soft spot for it mm. i think um just just to compare the two quickly um i think that both of them have their own challenges and limitations mm-hmm. um i think i was kind of a little bit turned off i don't know if that's the right word but um yeah put off by non-metallic metal especially in my like early um hobby sort of career you know when it was sort of becoming in vogue and you had people like um uh, alfonso winning you know spanish slayer swords at the age of 19 with non-metallics and that sort of stuff and then driving that um driving that sort of into vogue um the a lot of the people that tried to emulate that, especially in the early days, didn't have that kind of um, rendering um, theory applied to the techniques and stuff. So, like a lot of a lot of the examples and stuff that I saw in the early days, kind of appeared fake or too deliberate or, yeah. or quite chalky in their appearance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I just kind of decided at that stage, it kind that kind of look or whatever wasn't really for me. Mm-hmm. nowadays it's completely different though because you've got absolute painting masters that that do it yeah. almost sublime right yeah. it, it, it plays it plays a trick on your mind almost yeah. it's that yeah. good yeah however because i paint predominantly gaming pieces um non-metallic uh, uh, miniatures are generally sort of like championed from one view yeah like uh, like that hero sort of view that you look yeah. at yeah um, when you're photographing a miniature or, or, or placing it in a competition or whatever, and that's generally determined by what light source that miniature has and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think 
true metallics have more of a, a, a functional application to them where they will always generally look great in, in, in 3, 3D or 360 view or 720 view or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think with my Magnus, I still wanted him to match my collection and my arm, but I, I really wanted to champion the true metallic metal technique because I hadn't really seen it done to a level that I was like blown away with. Yeah. Whereas I had seen that for, for non-metallic metal and I understand yeah. that non-metallic metal is quite more painterly and mm -hmm. the traditional uh, artists or, or the, like the, the competition painters uh, really go for that because of how much sort of like control they have over the volumes yeah. and the light source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it really comes down to like almost like the, the properties of the paint. Yeah. So I think with like to just go a little bit technical with the with the with the composition of the actual paints, um, the metallic pigments uh, because they're actual metallic flecks in the paint, mm. the pigments are larger than what they are in a, 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 a like a matte paint or, or like a non-metallic paint. Mm. Um, so what that does is it presents limitations with how well you can or how subtly you can glaze an area or, or, or highlight an area so that the, the quality of the paint is different as well and mm -hmm. i think those um those factors in a metallic paint are more limiting than what they are in a non-metallic paint right okay. falling asleep with this talk i could tell he's just oh, absolutely not at all i just genuinely have something in my eye i'm not crying <laughs> i'm not crying well, I am, I am genuinely interested. No, please, yeah, please keep on going. No, I'm, I, this is fascinating, actually. So in order to kind of, um, I, I really want to kind of push the envelope or push the boat out on that, on that sort of technique and, and really um, take it to a place that I hadn't seen done before. Yeah. So I really went through um, uh, a little bit of experimentation with the look. So on that Magnus, for example, um, I used mainly scale 75 metallics, mm -hmm. A, because they're, they're quite good. I've used them on the rest of my army. Um, they've also got their limitations to them as well. Um, yeah. they, they're quite um, uh, jelly. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and when they start to dry, because they dry quite quickly too, they go quite gummy mm. on the brush. Well, that's true, actually. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's... So, so, so you really need to be like really deliberate where you, um, where you put your brush strokes with the metallic paint, with the non-metallic paint, because you've got, because you've got such fine pigments, you could always like go in and correct again with the brush or okay. glaze it back or, 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 or highlight it again. Whereas you do two, three more layers than what there should be on a metallic area it starts going claggy and, and the mm. paint turns thick yeah right so that's another limitation of the true metallic as well and um i, I don't think i don't think the technique get, gets enough credit really no um no. because it's actually quite difficult to pull off i think mm. um and this is me me by no means poo-pooing the metallic metal because that's just incredible in its own yeah. right right yeah. so we're talking about almost like two separate things but almost yeah. like the, the crossover in the venn diagram right that's what we're yeah. trying to capture yeah yeah. So yeah, that's, I was um, experimenting with those scale seventy five paints, mixing in um, flat colors as well for the pigmentation, as well as <laughs> inks in order to enrich like the shaded areas and stuff too. So I use old colors like um, old Games Workshop brown ink, for example, in yeah. the recesses, um, um, because what that'll do is it'll tint the metallic fleck um, in in the metallic paint. Mm. but not have a property of its own to kind of um, sit over, over the top of that and, and muddy that metallic paint. I, I know it's like super technical and it's kind of like hard to, hard to no, visualize no. without sort of examples and, and, yeah, and yeah. step by steps kind of examples. But yeah, that was like my, my, um, my, my fundamental mindset when sort of tackling that piece, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't uh, seen it, it's something quite quite special. And I think we've had a conversation uh, before about, you know, most of the Golden Demon winning things, which are often what we perceive as like the pinnacle of sort of hobbying at that point, um, has very, very few true metallic uh, pieces, complete pieces in it. I mean, that, that skink from Chicago um, 
uh, had some, but it was a, a, the tiniest amount. Um, so to see something of such a high standard uh, in true metallic metal is 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 amazing. And then just finally, I think the other thing I'd say about the work, Adam, I think these two pieces kind of illustrate is just your attention to detail. Um, all these things, you know, you might just paint it with a contrast paint like that, that little screen. Um, but instead, you know, you've really gone to town on it and you created like a Star Wars S kind of um, kind of like data screen for the for the for the speeders there, which is just absolutely awesome. Have we got any more of Adam's work there, uh, John, on the next one or is that? I... No, no. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so but we really appreciate you coming uh, coming on board for this one. Um, and uh, any time, guys. Us, Thank you. Um, some some insights. But if you if you are a viewer and you want Adam to kind of talk more about kind of painting um, as opposed to sort of the gaming that we often talk about with Heresy Hammer, um, I'm sure that we can get him on and do a bit of a mm-hmm. kind of a painting just... um, Heresy Hammer. Um, kind of absolutely. Uh, I could talk about it all day, really. So you'll find yeah, it, quite... you'll find it hard to kick me off. <laughs> quite keen to sack this whole thing off now. Just go and paint something to be honest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but we do have our typical um, uh, heresy hammer. Now we've got a few yeah. uh, bits and pieces. Now we will. Uh, look, we, we, we need to. We need to let people behind the curtain a little bit. There is oh, no. Yeah. There's no news this week uh, no. on this episode, and the reason is is because Rob and I are recording four episodes back to back, basically because. Yeah. Um, I'm going away and Lee is on leave. So um, otherwise it would just be Rob talking into the void at you for, <laughs> for the exactly. next sort of three weeks. So, so um, yeah, there's no news, um, which means it's going to be a slightly short show. Um, that's yeah. why we haven't got a little bit of spice that we'll come to in a minute. Yeah. But um, we have got some uh, hashtag heresy hammers to look at. So yes, indeed. Oh, I forgot what I'm presenting. You're presenting this one. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. You can you enjoy this. We've got such a good dynamic going. Today. Just, essentially, we've become one entity. We've exactly become right. Yeah, well, mind. Um, so we have. So we've got four other people's piece, uh, pieces of work, and then and then we'll we'll have a look at what comes next. So we've got the grim and the dark um with an awesome uh death guard uh praetorian or centurion or something here adam do you want to give us your hot take on uh the grim and the darks um efforts on his uh kind of centurion it looks great doesn't it the um i, I really like the, the the drabness of it and i think that's got to do with like the matte finish um, yeah, you can really see that matte finish, really super finish on the metallics and how, how the light sort of just like it's really satin over the shoulder pad and looks really, really drab and evil and fitting for, for the Death Guard. It's terrific. And I like the red eyes too. It makes him look yeah, really sick absolutely. and evil. It just draws you almost straight. Vader-esque, right? Yeah, very Vader sketchy. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. For um, we have another fellow Australian here, uh, Raptor Imperialis, Kieran's. Uh, Kieran's I think this is a ghost legion, from what I can understand. I don't really know. Alpha legion, legion is. I believe. Is it? Is that what? Is that it's an mm. alpha? Very cool. Um, and it looks a little bit different because I think it's got an OG beaky helm on it, so it looks rather a bit more sinister than a normal um, kind of uh, the plastic uh, beakies that we're used to. Uh, the weathering efforts he's gone to here is excellent. Like, there's no chipping or anything like that on it. I know he was considering that, um, but the weathering, the colour of it just looks so nice and it's just that really clean style, but, you know, that clean style combined with the weathering that Kieran just does so well. Immaculate painting as always. Um, John, let's go to the next one. I'll let you do the next one. You can tell us about this one. I will. I'll tell you about painting mayhem. Now I can't remember if you've seen this before. We've looked at painting mayhems before, but we I have. don't think one hundred percent. We've looked at plenty of Lee's tut over the uh, over. I'm the not sure we've done this apothecary. We haven't, and it's great. I mean, like, so for those who aren't necessarily, so Lee is a phenomenal painter. He's very new to. Um, the Instagram scene, but he deserves about 10 times the followers that he does. You will definitely have seen his work shared around various groups. He does unbelievable levels of freehand. He's starting to attend a lot more events as well, which is really cool because he's a super lovely dude to hang out with as well. Um, But yeah, just like absolutely unreal painter. Again, um, I think this is all true metallics. So continuing a theme here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like the um, I think the the kind of the blue tint to the white, especially in the shadows, it's sort of blue gray works really really nicely and kind of binds yeah, it, it really together. Is. 
Yeah. Yeah. What more can you say, really? Looks Great. awesome. Um, and then we have Riff for Sean, who's got some awesome space walls. Now, again, I couldn't remember whether we showed this, but I thought it was worth if we if we've already showed it, it's worth a second showing, which is an awesome awesome space walls uh, contemptor. I think Riff Forge is a commission painting studio. Other commission painting studios are available, um, and um, but I. He's done a great job with this, right? And I know I that the Rift it's... Forge guys do battle So I think it's largely, like... yeah, yeah, I was about to say it's battle reports as well. So I think it's largely Sean and uh, Neil. Yeah. And uh, who also host events as well. So obviously, bear in mind, we'll come to talking about events shortly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's, yeah, bat reps, a bit of uh, converting work as well. Mm. I've actually painted a couple of conversions that Neil has done for a couple of clients over the course of oh, a year or so. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, I did a Horace Aximand mm. and a something else. <laughs> Clearly stuck in my mind. Something good. Late over um, it was great. It was genuinely very, very good. So. Superb. Uh, Adam, what's your take on the grey here for Space Force? Because it's always uh, an interesting one, but it's too blue or too boring. But what's your take on this grey? Well, it's a, it's a space wolf, so I can't hate it enough, really. <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, we've all seen some I'm space kidding. Space. Um, I actually like this. I think I think they've nailed it perfectly. I think if you go too flat in the grey, uh, it tends to look boring mm -hmm. and there's not enough interest in it. I actually like the cheeky blue, uh, blue tint that he's put in the shadows there. It's subtle, um, but it adds enough to the scheme where it just creates that subtle bit of interest that you probably don't recognize straight away. Mm -hmm. um, however, he's done it quite tastefully here. So I think um, in in general, mm -hmm. Space Wolves need that kind of just subtle shade color or, or whatnot just to make this game a tad more interesting. Yeah, That's I've seen good. quite a lot of success with um, like some sort of purples or sort yeah. of kind of like red. Purple looks great. As well. Yeah, totally, yep. totally green. Awesome. Otherwise, yeah, and there's no good. right, there's no right or wrong to it, right? It's just a personal aesthetic choice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Paint the blue if you want to. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. This is a forty k uh, blue. Uh, this person yeah. is a little bit closer to home if we look at the next uh, two um, two slides. Uh, so I thought we'd choose some of your work, John, and then some of mine as well. But um, mm. uh, because we don't show enough of our work, I think we often talk about the gaming that we do, but not necessarily mm. lots of the lots of the hobbying. Um, and John. Had slash has um, an awesome Iron Warriors force, and he got it all out relatively recently in the past few months and took some photos of it, and it was quite spectacular. And I think the thing that kind of took me by surprise was how much you actually had this this thing you've been beavering away over the past couple of years mm -hmm. on. Um, it was incredible. You basically had an entire legion in your um, in your Cornish home, and it, it was a spectacular sight and something. To thank be you, thank you, of. thank you. Have you? Uh, have you still got some of this army? At I've least, got or? part of it at the moment, but half of it has gone to a new home, new home. and the, the other half will be joining it in sort of the, the, the sort of the springtime. So Excellent. I have a, uh, I have a, a particular gentleman over. Why is that John? Why did you say? Yeah. Yeah. I got, bit, I got a bit carried away if I'm being brutally honest with you. Like I kind of got it all out and realized that I had, and um, I, I'll be honest with you, I tend to fund my hobby by kind of by by my hobby. So recycling. Uh, yeah, basically. And it had got kind of a bit big and a bit much. Um, and I needed to kind of um slim down my collection. Anyway, I've got probably about yeah, about thirty thousand points currently in varying states of completion at the moment. And uh, I have a gentleman over in the States, a good friend of mine, who uh, likes to rehome a lot of my armies, and he said if uh, I were to ever want to sell the Iron Warriors, give him a shout. And uh, I sort of said that maybe I was starting to have a bit of a wobble. And um, would he took he advantage of, of, of said wobble, did he? Would he be interested? And uh, we agreed on a price that was satisfactory for both parties. And Excellent. yeah, they are beginning to make their way over there, the over the way. There, there is something to be That's said. Perfect... Sorry, Alan, go for it, go for it. Yeah, it's a perfect excuse to start at uh, Iron Warriors 2.0. Yeah. Uh, I may 
or may not have already got seller's regret, if I'm being perfectly <laughs> honest with you. I might already have written a couple of army lists for some events at the tail end of the year. One or may the one of or may or may or may not be hosting. So we'll uh, chat about that it, later on. It is interesting, I think, when you get collections that big and that vast and you get them out you go jesus christ like I've, I've got hell, so, an absolute... so, so much here because also you know you are often capped at three thousand points at events and often yeah. gaming you know, yeah. locally whatever and you're kind of like do, do i need this vast array and you know the temptation to sell parts of it at least to fund other armies or things like that i think is... as well right especially because you kind of you really fall into sort of traps really but you you end up either deliberately not trying to take stuff because you see it as a bit of a crutch, which is, oh my fucking God, it's the stuff I take all the time. Mm. But like, I cannot remember the last Iron Warriors list that didn't have a squad of Iron Havocs with auto cannons. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as we've discussed in the last episode, um, like I gave the Siege Vindicators a run out recently, and now they're coming in plastic, so yeah. it's kind of a bit easier to do those. Um, and I'd actually, I'd really, really like to do some stuff with some some third party stuff this time around mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um I'm, I'm not into 3d printing or anything at all but i think it's it's potentially time to to get into it so i think i might look for some just do a little maybe start with a little allied detachment okay go about it in a slightly different color scheme but yep. yeah i mean like i said i got it all out and i thought oh my fucking god what <laughs> it was it was quite uh quite quite a yeah so if you if you head over to instagram or even on tiktok now actually you can see it there's some some reels and videos of the whole the whole lot out so excellent and then um your purse bravo really is worth mentioning because um, Thanks, you clearly spent a long time on this because it looks fantastic and and had really thought about kind of particularly the the true metallic elements that you know that um that adam was just talking yeah, about so, you know, glazing into the shadows making it darker yeah very you know, much that transitions you know yeah very much uh, again and adding um like non-metallic paint into the metallic paints in order to kind of so there's loads and loads and loads of like dark blues the browns um there's some like slightly off whites some grays obviously in there as well Mm. Yeah, it looks uh, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, no, Adam, had... what's your what's your take on John's Persa Robo? It's good. It's good. I, I like I like the element of adding the the matte paint into the shadows too, because what that also does is it provides contrast in another way, not just in tone, but mm. in finish as well. Because yeah. you've got that glittery metallic finish in the highlighted areas, and then and you've got a really drab matte finish in the uh, in the shadowy areas. So mm. you get that second layer of contrast as well right and it all just adds to the overall effect so you stack up all these one percenter style elements and then all of a sudden you've got a great product at the end right every percent counts oh yeah oh, thank you stuff. very much for your kind words your it's um and then something i've been uh working on of late you so, on, haven't you you, little you could have just copy and pasted yeah. the same image four times <laughs> I could have, I could have done. they've all got they've all got different bases um, but they, every single one of these sanguineuses were, um, were, you know, you, I think the thing is that when you look at batch painting, you kind of assume you get this image of like a factory style, but you know, every single one was done lovingly and they took way longer than I thought they would. You know, I was like, I'll give it, you know, um, a day and a half to do each one, then times that by four mm. and you'll be there. And, and in actuality, uh, it was it was not like that at all um but um it was a great project to do you know i um you know the the spear seems like quite a simple conversion but i had to take russ's hand i had to green stuff the um the joints in between um and utilize a lot of what um baz had taught me when he came down with um me and paul to do a workshop so if you are interested in uh green stuffing um i am not the man to go to but Anthiarius um on, on Anthiarius Anthiarius on instagram baz um he does do workshops so he does them around the country but we paid for a private workshop and it was it was worth its weight in gold it was a brilliant weekend i believe um, also as well he does some stuff uh, on the cult of paint patreon yeah, as well i think you can access some uh some stuff there but it well, was while you're uh, while you're subscribing to the heresy hammer patreon for just, <laughs> yeah. for just three pounds a month you can also maybe consider giving several times that to cult of pain in order to access some of baz's exactly. tutorials as well so patreon.com uh, forward slash heresy hammer 
but um but yeah it was it was a great great project to do again that true metallic um you know just leans into the true metallics it was a lot of fun doing that although edge highlighting all of sanguinis's armor was uh somewhat time consuming but it was the um all the other bits the leopards and things like that that was the really that that was the bit that that took a long time um but i was the thing that i'm most proud of is it the wings miniature is not the wings actually it's the base like oh, and um, i was gonna say the wings the wings, too. the wings are good the you wings like, are good like the wings yeah i they tell I, us about the wings rob yeah okay yeah. so um but the base. they i used um so my my thoughts about the wings was that you see a lot of sanguinis with almost like pure white wings um and i've often thought that mm. they kind of take away from the actual him himself you know they're so bright often you know they halo him and they're just reminds me of like a bretonian pegasus knight or something you know yeah like that's, so exactly, that's exactly it yeah so i wanted something way more way more um calmed down and so i used a lot of sandy um sandy tones rather than white tones um but um kind of you know i built i built it up did um kind of car keys uh in the shadows um kind of lighter versions of of creams and sands uh in the highlights um dry brushing to get those those feathers out um and then hit it with blacks and reds uh from below to get that kind of like that tone from the um kind of the tone from the base um and yeah they came out really well one of the ones i did the client said um i don't know if you remember but in echoes of eternity um there's a imperial fist uh legionary pulling out a spear from sanguinis's wing um and he said you know i want i want sanguinis to have that kind of blood splatter on his wing so i kind of matched it up and made sure it was all right and and that that was pretty fun doing that just yeah. and everyone's a little bit different everyone's individual there's um, also a passage at the beginning of um the end of the death where it mm. talks about how sanguinis is making his way back to the palace and his his wings are in tatters and the feathers yeah. are hanging out and they're covered in scorch marks and burns and yeah, he probably looks like one of those pigeons that have been on the street for way too long. You know, it's like real ratty looking. Oh ones yeah, absolutely. To hang around for your food. Yeah, we'll get stuck in a chimney, and you have to then free them and just <laughs> kick around the door. Um, and then you my... found dreadnought as well. Great, well done. Let's move on. Yeah, yeah, and then the dreadnought. <laughs> um, and was particularly pleased with how uh, that came out. But there's a guide for that on Instagram and YouTube. So if you just using a new army painter speed paints. Yeah, that's exactly it. Over a silver base coat. It was really, really simple to do, but really pleased with how it came out. And I used some, uh, for that one, used some fluorescent orange um, mixed in with the um, uh, kind of orange weathering powders. Um, uh, and it really made the base uh, pop, I think. I think yeah, absolutely. Really yeah. Awesome. Right, should we have a look at the next bit before we uh, go for our break? So this is the uh, contemptuous contemptor section. We invited uh, feedback in the comments and over on Instagram and uh, over on Facebook. And these are some of the comments that we received. Basically, everyone thought they were turds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we yeah. need to play a little game. So I um, I received a message from a, a wonderful gentleman called uh, James who lives out in the Far East. He is flying the flag for heresy in Thailand. Would you like to hazard a guess as to how much a Contempt of Dreadnought upgrade kit with express shipping costs to reach Thailand in, in UK pounds? Uh, in much? UK pounds? Oh, my God. Um, uh, just, just, the, just, the... So just the torso and um, with the non-standard. So the, the non-standard so standard shipping, I think, in the UK is three quid, and I think it's six pounds for express shipping. Oh, okay. I'm I'm gonna go forty five quid. Adam, I'm gonna say twenty five for the torso and seventy for express shipping to Thailand. Oh, oh. you're not far wrong. So your your guess was ninety five pounds. Is that correct? Is that what you yeah. said? Okay. So the actual price in GBP to get one of these atrocities over to Thailand is ninety four pounds. Fuck my much. life. Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's fucking nuts. £94. £94. That's obscene. 
And is that just the conversion and the shipping? Is it? To yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I think the stand. I think the torso itself. I'll tell you exactly what he said. Hold on a second. Um, please pause. Well, while you're while you're while you're looking for that, I'm going to read a few comments that we got because John said in the last show, he said, you know, if you think this is a good decision, let us know. And nobody in the comments said it was. And so we had people say, "Dread sets a complete disaster." A complete review on the on the contempt is an absolute piss take, et cetera, et cetera. This was not a good move. Go on, John. Tell us what um tell us what your friend said. Uh, so uh, if you want it to take the rest of time, it will only cost a mere £45. <laughs> of course, right. It's so basically <laughs> double, uh, double price. Yeah. Super duper. Um, excellent. Right. So that is it for the first session. What a fascinating and different uh, first session. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I've had a, uh, I have had a genuinely just a lovely time. Yeah, it's been great. Um, be ashamed oh, to bring it something semi <laughs> Yeah, um, but when we come back from the break, we're going to be discussing uh, events and all things events, whether you're an attendee or an event organizer. So, see you after the break. Uh, right, welcome great. back to uh, the second part of Heresy Hammer today. Um, we are going to be discussing in this section uh, planning and delivery of a Horace, Her a Horace Heresy event. Now, Adam has uh, sorted out his laptop. I don't think the Australian government have uh, invested in high-speed broadband as of yet, but he seems to have uh, sorted it. Uh, but he might disappear and then just go to audio, uh, depending on mm. whether he kind of like stutters. It's, it's, it's stutters. TikTok spying on his heresy content is what it is. <laughs> Internet's <laughs> twice the price for half the speed here. So. Yeah, mate, you've, you've got to get that chip off your shoulder. You can't carry that with you the rest of your life. It would just ruin it. <laughs> Um, so all of us in some way, shape or form have either attended events or um, and or actually and or um, hosted events as well. Now, um, it is a big undertaking to host an event, whether it comes down to the terrain, getting that ready, getting the missions ready, um, you know, sorting out the tickets, sorting out ringers, sorting out people, oh, venue. Day, sorting out a venue. It is a big, big undertaking. And I think that what we wanted to do with this show today was, I think, for, so for me, I think if you're interested in organising an event, this might be a good kind of show to watch and kind of go, okay, yeah, I feel confident after listening to all the, the pitfalls and all the positives and all the good things about doing it and all the things that could go wrong, um, I feel comfortable doing it. Or you might be somebody who's thinking about it and go, actually, I haven't considered a lot of these things. I need to sit down with a pad and pen and, and kind of, you know, think a bit more in depth about it. Um, as we go through, we've already started talking about some ideas that John is having for our next Heresy Hammer event in um, uh, in in autumn but also from uh adam's perspective you know the, those guys in australia have a different event scene to us it seems to be a uh, quite a popular event scene um but it'd be good to get his perspective on whether these things are the same whether they're different uh you know over there as they are here um but also he's a man who has an awful lot of gaming tables tucked away in his garage um so it'd be good to from his perspective, to talk about how he stores terrain uh, and also what he went through to be able to create that terrain as well. So, uh, and these guys haven't seen the questions that I'm going to pose uh, to them as well. So I will kind of go through, ask them questions and then give them give them my thoughts as well. So no time will be given to kind of consider your, consider your answers. So let's have our first slide, please, John. So I think if you are hosting an event, the very, very, very first thing you need to consider about whether or not you want to host it is why. Um, so lots of these things are not mutually exclusive. Um, and I think that you might be doing it for money, although you won't be making a lot of money, um, especially in your first few events. Uh, no. You might be doing it for community. You might be doing it because there isn't a large um, kind of Horace Heresy community locally to you. Um, you might be doing it just because you want to. Um, but John, you know, from your thoughts, you know, you're planning an event in autumn. You know, what, what's your rationale behind hosting an event? Why would you want to host an event? 
Oh, that's a good one. So obviously from our perspective, from uh, the, the Heresy Hammers perspective, we, we sort of made a bit of a commitment at the start of the year that we were going to um, host host a few events this year. You know, typically we're thinking kind of probably four, three or four this year, and we were going to try and split the burden a little bit. So obviously you've, you've currently run the first two and are preparing, uh, I think we've now sold out the third one, correct? We have, yeah. So we have Lee's slightly different slant event coming up in May. Yeah, so his is more, we'll talk about his in a bit, but his is yeah. more a campaign than it is. Sort of Absolutely. Was. And I was about to say, and I, I'm going to do more of a kind of a campaign weekend uh, in probably the autumn or may, maybe somewhere, maybe not quite so narratively slanted as Lee or sort of, um, I think probably maybe somewhere kind of in the middle, really. Yeah. Um, but as we will discuss later, I think I've got a few different ideas of things I want to introduce into into mind. So the reason I want to host an event is because um, I like going to events mm-hmm. um, and I want to take some stuff I've kind of learned from hosting events previously and the stuff I've been to over the course of the last sort of two or three years and kind of really kind of amalgamate that, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and like I said, you know, we made a bit of a commitment to, to host some. And I don't think it's fair that you have to do the donkey work. So it's only <laughs> only right that I yeah, yeah, every but... so often chip yeah. in and do a bit of hard work. So what you're going to say is that you're going to be the face and Rob's going to do all the work. <laughs> Rob's, yeah, uh, Rob is very much the brawn and I will very much make up the brain. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we? Um, Adam, how about yourself? So you've hosted a couple of events in the past. What's been your kind of motivation to, to host events? I mean, you've also got tremendous amounts of terrain ready for these things as well, right? So what's your mm. what's always been your rationale to, to do these things? The terrain, uh, the terrain's a monumental effort. I'm sure we'll get to that in, in a separate stage. But I think the the reason for me wanting to run an event is I looked at, you know, as I was saying, you know, you have those moments of self-reflection in your hobby every sort of couple of years. Mm-hmm. I got to a, a stage where I, I kind of reflected upon what my hobby had been for like the last 10 years where I had been going to events and um, recognised that, I've been a participant and enjoying myself for, for so long. Um, I, I kind of thought that it was my turn to kind of give back to a community that's given so much to me. So, um, and, and that's just, uh, you know, being an, an event organizer and choosing to do it is, is a whole new experience. Yeah. So that was refreshing for my own hobby too, but it's also rewarding in its own special way too. And that, and that rewarding feeling is infectious too, which, which makes yeah. event organizers run their events year after year or whatever it is, right? You're so, actually- yeah, I think it was more of like a yin and yang style scenario for me. Mm. Like, yeah, I've been a participant and enjoyed myself for so long. Mm. I'd like to try my hand at it and give back. That's really interesting. So kind of a more community kind of driven kind of like element of it. It's interesting you say that actually because what like one thing being a teacher that I did enjoy is being at the front of a classroom people listening to me, children listening to me, and you know, almost being the centre of attention, really. And um, that I really enjoy and miss that about, about teaching. Um, you know, you have a presence in a room and, you know, you're, and you, you have an impact on people. And I think that one of the things I loved about particularly the last event was that you could tell the buzz in the room, the concentration in the room, the, the feeling when people walked away and you just got that that really positive feeling that all the hard work you've done up to it, because there are moments where you're like, fuck, why did I fucking decide to do this? And it's usually in this like two or three day lead up to it. Um, you know, the, the general buzz. And as you say, it is a really positive experience as an event organizer when it when, when it goes successfully right you know is, is um, what you're saying rob that you often have some sort of regret when it's you and your girlfriend standing outside in the snow spray painting <laughs> terrain four days before yeah. An event. <laughs> yeah although i think that that terrain actually me, me and the missus doing that is actually like it's been quite nice like involving your you joke stuff. you joke but i've 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 recruited my missus to help with terrain as well so yeah yeah it's a very it's a modern modern experience good. Yeah. yeah she's she's a bit better at it than i am you know with the terrain and stuff you know she was creating icicles from uh uh from from various bits and pieces for that for that terrain cool so um we we didn't really i mean i said it right at the beginning but i think that um you know, money i think is an in, is a factor to discuss because these things are not also mutually exclusive 
Um, if you get to a point where you have a set of terrain um, and you're able to recycle that and perhaps replenish it every so often. But if you have a large set of terrain, lots of mats, and your venue costs are relatively low, it does mean that you can eventually make a profit from it, right? And you would you probably put quite a lot of that profit back into terrain um, and back into events and things like that. But it does mean that hosting events can also fund your hobby. So it might be something um, you know, which is which is a positive, I think. So it's just something to consider. I think before you embark on it, I think you need to be really clear about the reason why you want to host um, host an event. Absolutely. And if you're not clear about it, be clear about it before embarking, because it's quite a journey from the point you get tickets up or the percolation of ideas to 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 the last, you know, the locked door on the last day. Um, it is quite a journey. Anyway, let's have a look at the next bit to consider. So this is one. I have always, um, uh, to some extent, kind of struggled with, right? So the first one is, what the fuck is narrative? Um, and when we talk about oh, events... Oh, man, you are opening such a Pandora's box, Rob. Absolutely. Um, like and um, because in my, it, like, I suppose, before I get to you guys, I think that the best way that I see it is a sliding scale, which is that, you know, you have, you know, the very, very basic kind of narrative, the Willis vs. Traitor, to very kind of um, in-depth narrative. And I think the, the far end of that scale and the best kind of example of that I've been to is probably 30K Frontiers event, where it's very immersive, very narrative driven, often different things can happen in a game and that will affect the next game, right? Um, so, you know, we can have a discussion about that, but also within that, can you even have competitive events in Heresy? So. Adam, for you, what what would you describe as a kind of like a narrative event, and where does it stop being narrative and become competitive? And you know, what what are your thoughts on on narrative events? I think that's the sixty four thousand dollar question, Rob. Yeah. Uh, and how long is a piece of string, really? Because everyone's <laughs> interpretation of narrative is different, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think I think to to put your event in an air quotes narrative, yeah. um, I think the needs to be some sort of fundamental structure to your event that right. gives it that feeling, right? Whether that's how you pair people up, whether that's the tables that you're playing on, whether that's the story that's kind of interjected in between each mission, um, or it, it, could be a, it could be a plethora of things, yeah. right? Um, it's up to the event organizer's discretion to really choose what they want their event to focus on or to be about. And I think um, narrative is such a loose term, it's it's open to interpretation. I think, um, uh, yeah, I, I do, so I'm just gonna interject here. So I think that um, you're absolutely right. One of the problems around narrative is that it means so, it means different things for different people. Yeah, And I think that um, it is very difficult then to nail down exactly what it is. So I've been to events before, which are basically just you throw down for, for three days, for, for, mm. for three games on a Saturday, somebody's written some back story to the planet you're fighting over. And that is the narrative. Whereas, you know, there are some events that I've been to that are branching. So um, a company of legends event I went to, what happened in the first game impacted the next game, impacted the next game, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so it was like almost like a choose your own adventure style, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. To, to my mind, a narrative event is, is, is just that in the fact that you are essentially just partaking in someone's rendition of a story. Right. Um, I, I personally would feel that a, narrative element doesn't necessarily have any real kind of connotations of competitiveness other than um loyalist versus traitors or it might not even be loyalist versus traitors it might be just legion or legion or it might be legion versus mechanicum or it might be yeah. mechanicum or mechanicum but i think that i think the choose your own adventure is is definitely you you want to believe that the actions that you are having on the table to reflect how how the event is going to roll out mm. i've got i've got two points two two more points to make i don't think that narrative and competitiveness are mutually exclusive no i think that might be a spicy take as well maybe I, maybe, we're, we're maybe it's not what people want to hear too but there definitely is like an eclipse in the middle 
um, that is a sweet spot for some people, not all, some. Um, and I don't think that they sh- that they necessarily always need to be segregated. Yeah, I think as an EO, it's important to sort of um, set the attendees' expectation of what is narrative early on too. So if you've got like a player pack or an event pack, mm-hmm. um, I think those are the sorts of things that you should be outlining to people who are thinking about attending. Because if they rock up with a narrative list to a narrative event and they get clubbed like a baby seal for four <laughs> to six games or whatever it is over a weekend, they're not going to enjoy their time, right? Yeah. So I think, I think setting expectations is quite important mm-hmm. um, among, among your inte- attendees. Yeah. And just to give two examples on narrative as well, in, in, in the two um, events that I've run last for Heresy, one was... Um, called Preferred Enemy, the Battle of IS, and that was focused on one particular planet, right? So my narrative for that was I would tally up all the victory points between the loyalists and the traders, and then I'd have an, a live map that gets updated showing all the territories that are being taken mm-hmm. by, the, by the two factions yeah. with, with a running tally of VPs as well, right? So mm-hmm. people really got into it and fought for their side across the weekend. Mm-hmm. Every table, every table had a different mission that was that was table dependent. So not everyone right. was playing the same mission. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, but what, what they were playing for was a contribution to the overall score, and that was the narrative essentially. Yeah. The 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 last event that I run was called Preferred Enemy Demagogue, and that was that was a linear like a a, a linear story mm. based around one character essentially, and everyone played the same version but their own story with their own army right so that's very interesting okay so so it's like completely and other either end of the spectrum isn't it that one yeah that's right yeah okay that's interesting wow which one but both um, could be considered narrative right yeah definitely which which one was easier to organize from your perspective definitely the uh preferred enemy demagogue which was the the more linear one Mm. right because um, at the at the event prior to that, I had mm. to tally up victory points across forty players every mm. single round. Mm. Then I also had to update a live map. Yeah. So for that, I was using like um, well, just going back to like my you know being a graphic designer or whatever. I used Photoshop and whatever to create the map, and I put it on the projector screen so yeah. everyone could see it round by round. Yeah. Um, but that was additional labor for me, and then also creating a separate mission for each table and terrain type that's a lot of work prior to so that. there was like 20 missions to design and yeah. not five yeah um whereas for the more linear uh narrative event i had cut scenes um and 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 short videos describing mm-hmm. the narrative to all the players um on the projector screen as well mm-hmm. um but they all played their own version of the same story so they all played the same mission just on different tables and you didn't have um in, in the demagogue one, you didn't have um, kind of a, a loyalist versus traitor victory points, or you did have you did have that. I did, but it wasn't the main focus. Got it. <clears throat> yeah, it wasn't the, the main focus was for each player individually to to uh, get drawn into just that linear story that I created for that event. That's really interesting. Really, I mean, man mm. alive. Yeah, well, either either end of the either end of the spectrum for that. I think that what's a common theme for everything that we've said so far is that um, kind of it doesn't matter like how in depth the story is, but a story needs to exist, and it's about the journey that your army takes or your your side takes in the, in in that. Um, John, if you got any more, I think so. I think so. I think so. But I think there's also like the the story is already established, right? It's the Horus yeah. Heresy. Yeah, we know yeah, why. Yeah. We know we know why the sides are fighting one another. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All you're doing is bolting on some new stuff and yeah. and and making your own sort of extrapolation or, or, or isolated event in that sort of setting, right? Yeah, John. Any uh, just before we go to the next question, because I think that this is I because I do want to get into the competitive element um, yeah. in some detail. Any further thoughts on kind of what the fuck is narrative events or? No, I think Adam's been. I think I think we've I think we've we've kind of covered that a little bit. Really, I think that I think what people's expectations are of narrative events has changed. I think that um, three or four years ago, you could have run a just essentially a pseudo tournament with yes. a 
paragraph of story at the beginning of the event pack and called it narrative event. I Agreed. think how people's expectations are completely different. So I think if you want to pitch, yeah. if yeah. you are a prospective EO and you want to have you want to pitch it as a narrative event, you need to really, really think about the emerge the immersion level that you're presenting to your potential attendees. And if you're not a hundred percent sure that you're going to be able to bring everybody, everybody along on that journey over that weekend, I would probably maybe think twice about referring to it as a narrative event. Yeah. I think that's that being fine. said, I, I, yeah, yeah. 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 And I think that you could just call it an event, right? And that would be the way around. A hundred percent. So, so Adam has touched upon this, you know, he's talked about that, that Venn diagram and, and the fact that these things aren't, aren't mutually exclusive, which is having a narrative event and that competitive. So I, um, I would argue that mm-hmm. every single uh, narrative event that I've ever been to, there yeah. are people who take weak lists because yeah. they theme their army around something. They just like these particular units. Yep. And there are people who take absolute dick kicking lists yep. uh, to, because they like to win, but also they want to be immersed in the narrative as well. And I think that um, the, the, I think one of the problems around call, describing things as, as as narrative, which is that if you don't put very heavy list restrictions in or some kind of list restrictions in, um, it can be a bit of a bit of a free for all because the game actually isn't that balanced. Like, no, it, it like they, the, the game can be balanced if you put certain restrictions in, but there are better units than there, you know, than there are, are, are weaker units, and there are things that synergize well together, and uh, things that. Uh, and the, the problem you end up with as well, right, is the fact that I think from people from the outside of Heresy looking in, is all they say is, "Oh, it's just Marines on Marines," yeah. and we're like, "No, no, 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 no," because you know. You might have a Gorgon Terminator fighting against a Huskar, fighting yeah. against a Sekhmet Terminator, etc. I mm-hmm. think that the problem is when you start to try and balance things by bringing list restrictions in, you just end up in a situation where it's just grey marines versus red marines or blue marines versus white marines yeah yeah so I think that I think definitely um, and I think sometimes the problem is as well right is the fact that if you go to an event where like you tend to use like as an example right you, the events that you've been running you use a pseudo swiss system for parents yeah. right yeah. yeah in theory the cream will rise to the top and mm-hmm. the people who've probably taken are maybe a little bit less experienced in the game or have taken more narrative lists or yeah. haven't necessarily leaned into the strengths of their armies as much or just generally kind of don't really care as much yeah. as some other people do we'll kind of you know we'll, and everyone will sort of balance out the problem is, is over like a four game format over like a weekend, it, there's not necessarily a huge amount of time for people to kind of find their levels. Yeah. And I think that's that's where you can kind of sometimes fall into a little bit of a trap where you've got a very mixed yeah. ability, mm-hmm. mixed ability group, right? Uh, uh, yeah. So I, the, I, I, yeah. I, I'll, come to, I'll come to you in a second, Adam, because there's something I want to pick up on, on what John said. So I also think it's very interesting that we, uh, just as a Horace Heresy community, <laughs> also refer to often narrative lists because when we refer to a narrative list what mm. actually the synonym we want is actually a weaker list and actually you can still be very competitive and have, have a narrative list right you can have an all artillery uh iron so, well, this, that, that was the that was the example that i was going to make was mm. the fact that i uh so the first uh wrath of axiom event um, I took uh, an Iron Warriors Iron Fire list, right? Which is, let's be honest, nowhere near the strongest choice in yeah. so much that, however, I, I like to think of myself as quite a good player. Yeah. And the reason I took that Iron Fire list was, A, I'd never run it before. I wouldn't see if it was any good. Secondary, I painted up some of the units, like I'd got all the bombards ready and I hadn't ever used them before. And thirdly, I don't necessarily love the pressure of always ending up on like the top tables. <laughs> And um, <laughs> and finding myself against the same yeah, like three yeah. or four people. Yeah, that's um, a good point. Yeah. And the problem was is the fact that like in my first game, I came up against the absolute perfect kind of enemy for my army, and yeah. I earned a huge swathe of victory points. I was the top scoring traitor by an absolute country mile. And in most instances, I shouldn't. I would never score that many VPs again. Mm-hmm. Um, but it basically ended up putting me in, in a similar position in mm-hmm. that I was on like the top tables and then spent the next two turns getting my <laughs> getting my poo pushed in by people yeah, who yeah, bought kind of so very well. heavily synergized and yeah. very, very strong lists. Yeah. Um, and actually just sort of thinking, oh, just turn out 
turn there's nothing worse than turning up to the table and looking across at your opponent's army and just going i mean this is this is a lock for which i just do not have the key yeah yeah and that's, that's always a bit of a, a bit of a bummer right yeah uh, adam what's your what's your thoughts on the, on this issue you know i think i've got a couple of points yeah yeah go for it go i'm for glad it. i'm glad i'm glad john brought up pairing as well mm. because um I, i'm a big i'm a big advocate for swiss pairing Mm -hmm. whether it's narrative or not and i don't mm -hmm. i don't really like the the whole choose your own opponent hammer thing either at events because what essentially what you get from that is um people who already know each other choosing to play one another um which means that yeah they'll have a great time and 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 whatnot but you want those people um at your event like because because you're running something for the community right you want those new people socializing with new faces and, and that's yeah. how to strengthen and build a community right yeah correct is by people meeting more people right exactly. and galvanizing a larger group and and not sticking just with your little click or, yeah. or gaming group or whatever just playing yeah. in a different venue for example yeah 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 that's um, a very so fair point I think I think I think Swiss. There's there's also a really good second layer to Swiss that if you don't have any sort of army balancing mechanic at your events, mm -hmm. it'll separate the the good. Let's say the good players from like the not so good players, but mm -hmm. also the harder lists from the softer lists, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, someone with a soft list doesn't want their shit pushed in by some guy with a hard list, right? Yeah. No matter what, because they've paid good money to come to your event as well, right? So that's something you got to keep in mind as an event organizer too. Mm -hmm. um, but throughout my whole wargaming career, like a, a close, a close competitive game are always the best. Yeah, agree. Right? So what you want to do as a um, as a, an event organizer is pair up guys who are on a similar level, whether that is through the power of their list or through their playing capabilities. Yeah. So they can have a close game that is really, really fun and tight. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I kind of just think back, this just, just reminds me of like, um, like um, the UFC, for example, where the boss, like the boss Dana White goes, we sell holy shit moments. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's what they're about. Like you want that holy shit moment between two people on a table, you know, yeah. uh, uh, on, on that fucking dice dice roll edge, you know, yeah. you want that, yeah. you want to be selling that moment to people, right? Or as best you can. Yeah. Um, so I think from, and, and, you know, Swiss will balance out that 90, 90% of the field anyway. Yeah. Right? So it's already taken a lot of the um, 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 disparity between lists and between players away. Mm -hmm. So that people will have more enjoyable games overall, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the second point is if you are going to be putting in some type of list, list restriction or if you don't have a list restriction, I think a really good idea to, um, to at least screen the power level of your event is to get people to submit lists early. Yeah, yeah. Not just rock, rock up on the day with like whatever they've got. Because mm -hmm. you, as an event organizer, I think you've got a duty of care to the to the attendees to make sure yeah. that they've got a, they're they're going to have a good time. Yeah, for the That's money true. that they spend, right? See so that. Yeah. That, so yeah. I think the owner, like any any good EO, will take it upon themselves to just just screen them, right, and be like, "Oh, holy shit, red flag! There's a fucking warlord titan." In, oh, sorry, a, a <laughs> yeah. Titan in this list. yeah, sorry about it. Do you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it's I like, do know. Right, I know exactly he's, what you mean. He's yeah. gonna. Yeah, he, oh, it looks like, you know, he's going for, you know, the best general award or whatever, yeah. whatever it is, right? But that means, you know, four, four people over the weekend are going to suffer playing against. Yeah. And that's not what you want. I think that's a really valid point and certainly something that I learned from the last event. And there are two, I think me and John kind of discussed it in the last show, but and I know I've discussed it with you guys before, but there are two, two things that came out of the last event which kind of made me go, I need to start asking for lists and the first one was having the warhound mm. in um which i didn't expect but also having a list that had no line in and that was less about a power issue and more about the the fundamental mechanics of how the objective cards work and that for me was kind of the moment i was kind of like actually i do need to sc screen these lists and a screening doesn't need to be you know it doesn't need to be an hour with one list right you know it can be nah. five minutes looking at over being like yeah that seems perfectly reasonable or no 
t- tone that down. Maybe six Scorpius is not like is a, is a little bit. A little maybe bit thirty siege tyrants yeah. is maybe a little bit heavy handed. Yeah, and so, and what what that'll do subconsciously as well, it'll probably like self moderate your players at the event as well. Yes, that's correct. They'll be like, oh holy shit! If I bring something too rude, I'm going to get knocked back anyway. Yeah, I think that's and I think that's a really fair fair thing. And I think yeah, for for me, just listening to this conversation, you know, uh, even though I've run a, a few events now, a fair few events now, I um, I am it's a constant learning process as well. You know, if you get it wrong mm. on the first one, you can get it right on the next one, right? And, and that's um, that's fine. I I yeah, but I think my big thing is the uh, soft lists are not narrative lists. That is not the, the, the word soft and narrative are not synonyms of each other. I think that's, community that's is correct. I away. think that's something that we've, unfortunately as a community, has naturally sort of fallen into this trap. Yeah. In that narrative means shit and non-narrative means hard. Yes, correct. Yeah, correct. Because, okay. yeah, because, yeah, I think that's a very good point. Right, should we have a look at the next one? There's some great, uh, great discussion there. So this is more a, like, logistical kind of thing when you're thinking about your... Um, uh, about your day which is that probably you know the very first thing you're going to start thinking about is the venue mm. and um that's sorry spartans on the left hand side <laughs> yeah and <laughs> i have not been to sorry spartans but i heard terrible things about their asbestos ridden um <laughs> kind of shed that those guys play out of but the i think the thing around the venue is that it needs to have space uh it needs to have an infrastructure built around it. That kind of infrastructure is boring stuff that you might not consider. So toileting, uh, staff, uh, if there's going to be staff there on the day, or you, you know that what um, what needs to happen if there aren't any staff there, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, parking, really boring, but people need to know about, about parking. Oh, uh, man. Parking right? is my biggest i think this my biggest source of anxiety in my entire yep. life is where the fuck am i gonna park yep. don't lie john you probably just leave the porker in the no standing zone no 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 no, no. <laughs> no i am um, if i if i'm, if I'm going <laughs> somewhere where i don't necessarily know a hundred percent where i can guarantee to park i will i'll pre-book parking these days i'm yeah. a i'm a pre-book parking man yeah and uh because often like um, in, awesome. in in cheltenham which is a which is a, a a town kind of an hour and a half um away from from me mm. um the gaming venue was right in the middle of the town but as a result the parking was sort it's of like away. a 10, 10 minute walk away with yeah. all the gear right so you need to think carefully about the the infrastructure around it and then that infrastructure also includes food as well so whether and also as well, to... there are people out there that don't drive. So yes, is there are there public transport? Public transport. Yeah. yeah. Can people get to public it? Transport accessibility right? and 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 yeah. if it is a journey away, accommodation options as well. Yeah. yeah. So all of those things, I think, make for uh, uh, are things you're going to need to consider. Now, with the the school that we use, um, I know full well that the tables are about six inches lower. And as a result, people are kind of bending over lower. Now, it makes for a great cinematic bird's eye view. But I accept that the tables are lower because the infrastructure around the school is so good because it just has everything. You know, projectors, um, it has, uh, uh, you know, the, the screens that we need. It has the audio we need. It has the the, the staff room that we need, etc. cetera. Um, so there are sacrifices that you can you, you, you can make. I mean, John, we I went to one that you did, right? Um, that was in, you did. Like in stadium, Bristol, wasn't it? Yeah, in Bristol, yeah. yeah. And that had a great infrastructure built around it. It was really, really, really good from a venue perspective. I think the only thing was is it was slightly, slightly out of town. Yeah. So um, so I think like they had obviously on-site catering, but if you didn't want what they were serving food was a bit a little bit of a mission away correct yeah um so it was like pizza or kfc were like the two choices right yeah yeah, absolutely or like you were like a 15 20 minute walk into the city center so but i think other than other than that like that was that was something that's probably never going to be repeated just because it's just it, it was all part of like a wider Mm. um kind of a wider event really and um i think if i'm being completely honest 
oh man, it was just, it was so much hard work just to kind of, even just to organize that tiny little bit of a, of a wider thing. So, yeah. um, but, but yeah, I mean, and again, like from a venue perspective, it was, it was substantial and it came with all the facilities that you would, you would expect. Like it had a bar and it had uh, on-site catering, all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and people do, you know, people do like to have a drink sometimes when they're playing. Like quite yeah. often this might be like, if they're coming to a weekend away playing Warhammer with their friends at your event, like that might be the the one or two weekends a year that they they get away so i think that's also super like i mean like you know when we look at some of the stuff like the the greetings weekend is a really good example right yeah like i take a day off work for that yeah Uh, like i'll take a day off work either side of the weekend because like i want to travel up on the monday i don't have to rush home i say rush home drive the five hours back on a Sunday like I want to kind of be there early on the Friday and sort of take it all in and see all the boys and like have a bit of a like a chill out on the Friday and then go out for some like meal or the drinks on Saturday and like properly treat as a weekend like the the kind of gaming aspect is almost sometimes yeah yeah a side quest to the weekend really but the the school has the infrastructure to be able to the school the school is great other than the tables being fucking tiny and the chairs being but no but I mean the uh, the school in Northampton in uh, the the greetings events has the infrastructure because oh yeah apologies yeah 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 absolutely apart um, from again apart from obviously they provide on site catering yeah but then you are kind of at the mercy of what like Andy and and um, Chris want to do and yeah. if you don't and the food is don't get me wrong the food is great but if you don't want it you've got to kind of think you're, you're about stuck. it a yeah. little bit and you've kind of got to like stop at the little Tesco Express in the way and grab like a horseshit sandwich and some yeah. other kind of crap yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so Adam, what from your perspective in Australia, what's it like? How hard is it to get a venue in in Oz big enough for say 20, 30, 40 guys? Um, and what do you guys look for um, in in venues? I think that question is budget dependent, really, and what your budget is. Um, the more grand a venue you want, the more it's going to cost you, really, and the more you have to kind of take that into consideration. Mm-hmm. So if you know roughly how many players uh, you want at your event or how much space you're going to be working with, that might dictate your numbers. Yeah. Because I know I know at the event that that I run at the um, – I run it at a local uh, lawn bowls club mm-hmm. and um, we've, we've pretty much hit max capacity for the last three years, which is which is 40 players. Um, right. I've done – I've done 64 players there before, and that was just way, way, way too squishy. Like, like asses rubbing up against each other because yeah. you know, yeah. the tables are set that close, right? Yeah. And then no one's comfortable. Yeah. So you still want that that ease of walking space, um, and, and these are kind of like logistical things that we're kind of onto now. But yeah. um, you know, you want that you know trafficable area. You want clear thoroughfares. You want people to have room to have a chair at the table or whatever. Yeah. Um, but what the Bowls Club does provide as well is that it's in a great location. Mm-hmm. There's a tram stop and a bus stop right outside. Mm-hmm. It's a 10-minute, not even a 10-minute drive to a train station. There's plenty of ample parking. It's right next to a shopping center as well. Yeah. So it's only a two-minute walk to like a massive food court where you can get anything for lunch. Yeah. Uh, there's an on-site bar that's open from like venue open time to venue close. Yeah. Um, and although it's not like the, the most flashiest, it's quite modest actually in its, you know, in its appearance and whatever, because it's been there since the pyramids have been there probably. <laughs> um, um, you know, it serves all our needs to, to, to a really good baseline level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, really, and that's, that's and, that's the, and that's the best thing about it too. But, you know, there's also a, second, a secondary, you know, factor of, okay, well, Having it at you know a, a a bowls club that's kind of struggling for numbers and funding and stuff anyway that's another way you're kind of giving back to a different type of community right by yeah. supporting a local yeah. venue like that for sure absolutely what do you do about the not the mats and terrain but the physical tables and the MDF board do you have those or do the lawn club provide those so they've got some tables and chairs because they also host um, um, as well as bowling you know they've got the odd birthday there or they might have ballroom dancing one week or whatever yeah um so they do have they do have a numerous amount of of tables and chairs which helps us greatly right because that's like a whole 
plethora of logistical stuff that's already yeah. taken care of by the venue yeah. um, and, and stuff that can easily stress you out. And yeah. um, I've got all the MDF boards as well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for all the six by four tabletops, yeah. um, which is an absolute ball ache to, to store, but I'm sure we'll get onto yeah. that at some point. Yeah. Too. yeah. I mean, six um, by four and, is a uh, six by four is yeah. not actually that's quite, that. That's quite it, it's a quite an unusual uh, table size, right? As well. That's the thing. Like you could, yeah. like finding a table that's a six by four is not an easy easy thing to yeah to... and anything that the bowl the bowls club is lacking i'll just make up in like trestle tables or whatever there might be like three to six trestles as a top up if needed interesting okay and then um so yeah that that's actually raised some really interesting things i think that obviously you know the temptation to use like a, gla- a gaming club to to people yep. is um uh, you know, is always high because they already have the boards and you don't need to think about that. You're just literally Absolutely running the right. event. And where I've tried to book painting courses locally at things like village halls, what I constantly am faced with is that they might say to me, oh, well, you can have it on the Sunday, but on Saturday morning, it's yoga for, for tots or something like that for two hours in the morning. And I'm like, ah, oh, so I basically can't have this venue because it's like, you know, this local local hall because of, you know, something in the morning. So that's something that I've kind of faced before. And often these village halls have have the tables because often they, they hold rotary meetings or things like that. Um, but just booking in a slot and, th- and these like, you know, yoga is booked in for like a year in advance every week. And, you know, they have that, that, that booking. So yeah, it's not an easy one finding a venue with the right infrastructure, with the right tables, with the right chairs. It's definitely, if you find a I'm venue- I'm not sure, I'm not sure how it is for you guys over there um, in the UK, but another option is to also run at a gaming store. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but, yeah. you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of the time, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna ask you for a portion of the ticket price or a set fee or something like that too. So yeah. As an organizer, there are costs that you need to be aware of and yeah. and and to budget for as well. Um, yeah. Even though even though it makes your job easier, is it worth being out of pocket for? I'm not sure. That's that's, that's the individual's call. Right? Commercial real estate in the UK is very expensive. So you tend to find there aren't a huge amount of gaming stores that will have the capacity to host like 30 players. Like yeah. that they even like you'll find that most um there's a pretty successful shop near near me in Devon, actually, and they um have a small gaming a space within their shop enough for uh, like six six befores but whenever they do big like age of sigma 40k events again they go to a school they run out yeah. of school and just go yeah. and do it there yeah. because it's just it makes yeah it that that's it again the schools have the infrastructure yeah around. they've got everything there man they've yeah. got toilets they've got fire escapes they've got tables they've got one, diddy chairs. one criticism i do have of gaming stores and not every gaming store before I blanket, you know, but before I make this comment is that I, I find that they are, they are either sometimes untidy or they become untidy very quickly because there's not a lot of space in them. And I think that, that, um, you know, go and check out a venue right before you use it. You know, if you don't live nearby, go check it out, go get a game in that day and just be, just see what the vibe is. Um, because I think that, yeah, it's important. Anyway, we've covered loads to do with that. Loads yeah, of really apologies. logistical I, um, stuff, but it's important if you're considering like an event, right? The venue's the most important thing. Cool. Let's have a look at the next bit. So terrain, terrain. I think we covered quite a lot of this, but, um, uh, I did an enormous amount of research uh, to do with terrain when I was getting ready for the for the last two events. The problem with terrain is that it's fucking expensive if you want to do massive. If you want to do just a six by four, uh, a board that's filled up with terrain with enough line of sight blocking, it's it is going to set you back three hundred quid plus the time to build and then paint it to a reasonable standard. Then you also need a map, which is about 60, 70 quid on top of that. So after you've built a board, uh, you're not going to have that much money left. And this is one of the things I think that, you know, if you're running your own events, not in a gaming club and you're trying to invest that money back, you're not going to see a lot of money um, until very late in that in that process or after a fair few events because you're constantly reinvesting it in terrain. Now, one of the things that we did do and one of the things we've had done before, which actually worked really well, is that we've said to people, look, if you bring a map and you bring terrain, we will pay for your lunch at the, the Heresy Hammer event. 
and that works really well because people get a free lunch out of it they don't need to worry about food and and uh, you know for us we get a couple of extra um uh, tables with with variation but i just think that the best terrain personally i think or some of the best terrain is gw stuff you pay for it at a premium and um uh, you know you just you don't get a lot of bang for your buck what, what's your guys experiences of, of terrain and getting terrain ready for uh, gaming but also for for um for events john or do you oh, want me i mean because I, I could talk about this forever so. Gosh, <laughs> so last time i um i put on an event i rented all the terrain yeah um, that's, not, that's an option where, that's where, where, where was that where was that rented from john from a uh, quite a large gaming store, so they have right. quite. They have. They're one of the few that have quite a big event space. So we literally rented all of their tables. I think we rented sixty tables. Right. Was it cost effective? For the time, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, 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 hundred percent. It, it definitely was. I think, um, yeah, it was. It was very cost effective, actually. To be perfectly honest with you, mm. I mm. think uh, going forwards, obviously, I mean, so. Rob and I have been most of the most of the money that's been kind of we've invested into Heresy Hammer so far this year, especially with, with the investments that Rob's made, has been largely on terrain. Yeah, um, I mean we've spent um, eye-watering amounts of yeah. Uh, yeah on stuff on, on terrain. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so yeah. all the Patreon money that's where it goes to basically is providing tables for events, yeah. and even then, like it still owes us a fair amount. Um, we've got a few spare tables kind of kicking around. Rob obviously had the, weirdly had that Forge World table that he sold to me. Yeah. And then, yeah. So we've still kind of got it in the family. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. again, that money was, went back into, went back into terrain. That, exactly that actually. Yeah. I just poured that back into the, into yeah. it. So, yeah. um, but obviously we've still got that board. Should we need another one or something a bit different, a bit sort of special for like a centerpiece? Mm. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think having control of your own stuff good because that way you kind of look after a little bit more i think yeah. terrain can really make or break an event um and the, like i've seen examples of terrain from venues where i'm just completely put off going and playing at that event or at that venue because the terrain just looks so bad and i'm, like, I'm yeah. not 50 quid to go and play on yeah. with like two bits of jungle and like a ruin yeah um, yeah. but at the same time i would happily pay a premium to go and play on board such as um james is from orphan's hope that we did like we talked about last last weekend like i would i think and again when we talk about investments like financial investments i mean christ or fucking night i don't think that guy's going to break even for years but at the same yeah. time like, he's providing an unreal level of immersion with some of those um with some of those boards so yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, Adam, what's your, I mean, you, so you have spent the time getting terrain ready, right? I mean, you have a lot of awards mm. uh, already ready to go. I mean, that must have been a huge financial commitment, but also a massive time commitment for you as well, right? Absolutely. I think I think terrain is the, um, the biggest logistical problem for an event organiser. Mm -hmm. um, and, and biggest expense. Of yep. money and time too. Yeah. So it's it's like this huge, huge hurdle. And 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 once you're um once you're at a certain level, your life just becomes so much easier as an yeah. event organizer, Agreed. right? Yeah. But for the first event or two or three, like it's a real uphill battle to oh. to to gather enough terrain um to put on the style of event that you kind of you know have in your yeah. vision. Yeah. Um I think the initial out like, like let's say let's say you've never run an event before, right? What are you, what are your options when it comes to terrain? So you've got you've got an outlay of cost that you can take from your ticketing prices that you can put towards new terrain. Mm -hmm. Then you have to organize the the building and assembly and painting of that terrain as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then you might have hit your budget, right? And you're still short tables, so that's when you can ask around and ask people to pledge terrain. Mm. And I like what you did with the the hey, we'll buy your lunch yeah. um, um, option as well. And generally, people who are attending are willing to help out with that sort of stuff too. Yeah. Um, so in in your first year or two years or whatever, it's it's good to lean on those type of people for for support. Yeah. Um, and obviously, um, you want 
you want them to be reliable with that pledge as well, right? And, and follow through because the last thing you want is the morning of. Oh God! Uh, oh, God. Oh, with, oh, the with, worst, with the table worst, or whatever. Uh, right? uh, uh, that's when everything comes undone. Yeah. Um. So I know from my own experiences, I in my first year I had a look at my budget and I said, okay, I've got X amount to spend on terrain. So what does that mean? I could buy a table from Games Workshop, let's say, and it's going to cost me four hundred dollars. Yeah. Or I could um, be a little smarter, and uh, it might take me a little bit more labor, or a little bit more time, which I have or had at that time, um, and I might be able to make stuff that is quite cool. Probably not to the same level of detail, right? But it's going to look great when it's done. It's going to be practical to play on and it's going to be cost effective at the end of the day. Yeah. So I, cho I chose to make um, uh, a lot of my own terrain by hand. Um, and a lot of that was out of um, spare kits that I may have had. I chipped in a bit of money for some new kits, but most of it was either like made from cork or um, high density polystyrene foam. And I really tried to get creative with it in order to, um, in order to, produce enough volume for the mm. event mm. what that did of course it meant i had to sacrifice my own time and my own hobby time yeah so so it meant that you know i've got way more in my box of shame than what i should have <laughs> um but it was all a sacrifice in order to get the 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 standard of, of the event to a certain like like break-even threshold right yeah yeah so I, th I don't I don't think in the first year or two years, maybe even three years, I, 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 my goal was to just break even. But with yeah. each year, add more and more tables. Yeah, okay. okay. Right. So, so now I'm at a point where I've got 20 tables mm. of, of six by four terrain. I've got mm. mats for each table. I've got MDF tabletops for each table. And that's an expense that's already paid itself off. Yeah. It's just that initial outlay of time and 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 money and sacrifice yeah that's it's interesting as, that. as long as you're not losing too much and you're willing to kind of yeah. take that initial knock it, yeah. it, it pays dividends in the long run i think that's uh that's right and i think that um this also comes down to um because you you might find that you have put on your event and then you take your ticket money but you don't get your ticket money till after the event right so eventbrite is an example of that um there are various settings on eventbrite and i really like eventbrite despite it despite the fact that it costs quite a lot of money because i can email people really quickly just you know i've got an email list of those people i'm not faffing around with paypal um all the refunds are done through it right so i i quite like it but mm -hmm. one of the settings on eventbrite is that you get paid five days after the event so it might mean that you might need um the initial money to be able to buy all those things knowing that you're gonna you're gonna be able to do that and some people just don't have 1500 pounds sort of like laying around but there are de other options on eventbrite you can get paid on the first and the 15th but it is something to consider depending on where you are ticketing your event um what is the payment structure like because you might need that initial uh, like lump sum to be able to to get something and this is this is another point that um I, I, I put in my initial player packs as well, and I think it's important to be open and honest with the attendees as well. It's like if you're committing to buying a ticket, that means I'm committing to making and investing in terrain. Yeah. So if you have to pull out for whatever reason, I'm sorry, but I can't actually give you a refund. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and I know some people. Some people might see it like, the, oh, that's 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 you know what a prick that's unfair <laughs> right but a lot of the like like in my experience nine times out of ten they've gone oh okay i actually didn't realize that's okay yeah 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 fair, right fair which point. is which is great but that's because i've just been up front with them to begin with and say hey look there is a caveat on the tickets if you do for whatever reason can't make the event right you can either yeah. on sell your ticket which you have to organize yeah right or if you can't make it, I, I can't offer you a refund. I'm sorry because I've already invested that money into terrain for this yeah. year. And it's another headache, right? Trying to sell a ticket at the last minute or the, even in the last 30 days. Like people have lives mm -hmm. and, and you know get booked up quickly. But yeah, I think that's a perfectly uh, reasonable thing to say. Um, yeah, some really fascinating uh, points there. Should we have a look at um, our, our next bit, John? 
Can I can oh, I also just say yeah, sorry, too? Yeah, sorry, yeah, just to yeah, add sorry. to terrain. Yeah. Another important thing is the actual storage and the transportation yeah. of the stuff. So logistically, it's a fucking nightmare as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I know. I know that. I've, I've, I, at my last place, I only had a single car garage and inside there I had all the MDF boards and 20 tubs of terrain. Yeah. And, like, the missus will walk in and she'll be like, what the fuck is this? Ah, yeah. <laughs> it's meant to be for a right? car. What's you, going you on? You don't like... even use it. You use it once a year. What the fuck is it all here for? Yeah. yeah. Right? And, that's, and, and I completely understand that, right? It takes up such a large volume of, of area yeah. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, that's an issue too. So if you like, if you want to run an event or if you live in an apartment or oh, a, man, you know, a two bedroom yeah. place with no storage, for example, you really need to think about, okay, what are my storage options available to me? Yeah. And I, yeah. I'm only, I'm only lucky now because my best friend runs our local gaming club and, and he can actually store all 20 tables at the venue. Got so it. it's a win-win for both because the terrain gets used and, and, and my mate who, who runs the club gets to use it each week. But I also know. I win out because I don't have to store the shit. Store it, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, very- it's like you've got it all worked out, actually, Adam, really. <laughs> yeah. I've, been at it, I've been at it like four or five years, Judd. Yeah. <laughs> it's taken me up to this point, but yeah. Yeah. It, oh, it, and, and all that stuff all that stuff comes with time too. Like oh, as yeah. an EO, you don't want to put yourself under too much pressure or too much expectation it, it, you know like if you if you're if you're going into your first event thinking oh i need to turn a profit or oh, it's going to be easy um that's the wrong expectation to have I absolutely think. yeah and it's actually i think your like, main focus should be people having fun yeah um and and, a, and facilitating that environment for people and everything else should be secondary after that right yeah I think that's a very fair and uh, valid point. And actually, it might be that you start with smaller events than perhaps you might hope and then work up to bigger ones. And then, you know, Correct. That, that might be the, the way to do it. So we, we've already touched uh, upon this. I mean, we've yeah, talked about actually, Swiss and the, and, the, and the benefits of Swiss and asking for lists and things like that. Um, and, yeah, I think even from our conversation, I think that, you know, I think that's a it's really something that you need to put a lot of thought into because, you um, you know, you might not be able to trust all players to be able to balance their list, depending on, but also I would say the other thing I'd add that we didn't talk about, people's meta locally where they play is is different. And when you've got people from different parts of the country coming in, um, it, you will find that different metas face off against each other and won't do well or will do well against one another. So, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, even for me, I think that's awesome to say yeah. when all the metas kind of clash into this one. Oh, yeah. Part. Yeah, it's great to see because that's where you you know you, you find um, a lot of the most creative style of of list selection kind of wins out a lot of the time. Yeah, and absolutely. generally it's play, played by a good general too, right? Turns so, out it's actually three siege vindicators is actually the way forward. So way, uh, yeah, yeah, restrict them, start restrict them. I don't sleep on I, that. I'm telling you, don't sleep on that. One thing I will say, and. Um, we, we've spoken, that as a three, we've spoken about this an, an, aw, an awful amount, but I think it's worth having airing this conversation, is around special characters. Uh, so um, the, the kind of backstory to this is that, if, and if you have only been introduced to, to Heresy recently through, um, you know, the, the re- release of the Age of Darkness box, what tended to happen, lots of events uh, in 1.0 restricted special characters. And I think it was partly driven by um, kind of Centurion events. Um, the, lots of the Australian guys kind of restricted it that way. And then that kind of filtered over into the UK as a different way to play. Um, but lots of the, almost this obsession with describing a uh, kind of what I felt you know, a narrative event could only be narrative if it didn't have the main characters in because they were doing their own narrative things narratively somewhere else in the narrative. So uh, the, what a quick and easy way to create a narrative for event organisers would be like, well, there's no special characters, so it's our own thing, so we can't, po- we couldn't possibly have them. I felt that that, I always felt that people have painted up these things, spent a lot of time on their precious, you know, 50, 60, 70 pound Forge World characters and then never got to play with them. So I always felt like it was a bit of a shame. And um, uh, But um, lots of events I've been to have still limited special characters. John, what's your what's your thoughts on limiting so special characters? I primarily? think you can. So we've been talking about ideas for my event 
in October, right? And how we might do things a little bit differently. Now, I'm quite keen on the idea of restricting special characters, but giving people a pool of characters from which to potentially choose from. Right. And then building that into the narrative. Let's put so, characters in Britain or say like Alexis Pollux. Who is no, 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 no. Exactly. So like we might, for instance, you might be able to take Alexis Pollux and uh, Malagurst and uh, Corferon and Lorgar. And they are okay. the characters that are present in the system and they are the characters that you can choose from. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah, well, like um, I, I kind of, I don't really have beef either way actually on this topic. Like, I'm not like hugely emotive on this topic, on on either side. Like, I've, um, like I've, I've written lists. Like, I, I wrote a list for an event earlier in the year and thinking, oh, I'm going to take Perta Arbo. I've never taken Perta Arbo before. Fucking definitely Perta Arbo and Six Iron Circle. That'll be fucking fun. And then I was like, oh, fucking hell, there's no Primarchs lad at this event. <laughs> and then. Uh, and um but yeah i kind of don't really i kind of don't yeah, really, no, don't really you're mind. Ap- apathetic either way not, not yeah not. i really am i'm properly on the fence about this one and not not in a case of i don't necessarily have an opinion but my opinion is like it doesn't r- really matter to me i think special characters are cool i like characters and it's characters that drive the story right but at the same time like you know i've run the same warsmith for every event every yeah. single event and now he's caught kind of like a cool He's a cool team in my head. He's my guy. He's yeah. my guy. But at the same, and also playing Iron Rose, I haven't got any special characters. Doesn't actually matter. Yeah. So, yeah. That's uh, a fair point, actually. Yeah. So, uh, but like in my um, the list that I took to uh, Orphan's Hope a couple of weeks ago with my Sons of Horrors, I took Abaddon and Malagast. Yeah. All the special characters. No, yeah. just two, but still. <laughs> um, so yeah I'm, I'm not I, and you enjoyed that though you talked about how Malaga was, yeah, loved was it. awesome yeah yeah I absolutely loved it and I think it's really really cool but like I'm not I'm not super bummed either way okay cool Adam what's the history of special characters in, in Australia um, you know in 1.0 and, and take us up to now and then take us up to what you think about including special characters within your within your force so from what I know um, that Oh, of Heresy 1.0, that special characters uh, were generally advocated against mm. um, for events. Um, and I think that was just the proponent of who was choosing to run events at that time or who yeah. kind of spoke the loudest in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think just to touch on what you said, Rob, um, of, you know, particular characters, um, you know, at... Uh, or oh, sorry, the, the actual Horace Heresy characters being present at a particular narrative event or whatever is is kind of not, not a real representation of where the actual characters are in the Heresy or whatever. I think that's a real literal sort of take mm. on, on, on characters. Yeah. Um, where, whereas it, the game's based on abstraction anyway. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's fine for for characters to be included in lists. Um, yeah. uh, I, I love using characters myself, especially in one point where they used to unlock different builds a lot more commonly as well, yeah, right? Definitely. Um, so generally, the list or the type of build that you want to run is is generated by one of these special characters, and you want to mm-hmm. use them, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. there's been what. 40, 50, 60 novels now of, of Horace Heresy, you know, and, and there's and there's so much fluff and dense lore to, to, to fold back on relating to these characters. You know, you've got an emotional tie to them. You want to use them in your game. That's yeah. what they're there for. Otherwise, they wouldn't have rules. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think, I think um, to, to say, no, you, you have to make your own character for this event is a little bit, um restrictive or maybe yeah. like a little bit narrow-minded because mm. th- that might be narrative for one particular person but not yeah. narrative for the other right agreed um, yeah. and and that's where we come to that crossroads again of what is narrative it narrative. means it means different thing for every single person yeah yeah Absolutely. i think that's a re- really valid point the only thing i would say about special characters is um uh, and not worth a debate but i think the thing is the moment you let primox in they are so powerful that they can skew a game that I think in a way that, say, normal HQ characters, special characters, unique characters can't. So I think as an event organiser, you just yeah. need to consider, okay, if I let Primax 
you know, allowed into this event. Other people might not take Primarchs, and then how would that unbalance it? I definitely time? think that, unfortunately, the the biggest Primark counter is another Primark, and then yes. you just have this kind of overlap. Yeah. So yeah, what what Primarchs do is they they um, they break the fundamentals of the game essentially. Um, and they and they and they skew the game so far one way that the only way to kind of skew it back is to is to have another primark. So yeah, um, I yeah. think that and and similar to what you know Lords of War do as well. Yeah, mechanically they they shift the game so much that um, I don't know if it equates to um, a really good one v one player experience. Yeah, if, if it's so one sided that way and. You know, I'd be fine with just putting a blanket no on Primarchs and, Primarchs, and yeah. lots of war, especially for smaller points events, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but it's definitely yeah worth uh, worth considering, and uh, even in your own game groups, as the, those those mm. Primarchs are worth considering. Right, let's have a look at the uh, next one because we're sort of drawing to the drawing to the end. So, so um, we'll we'll talk briefly about this, right? And um, you know, Adam, you talked about it about writing missions for for every table at your event. I think one of the things that I would say about missions is that there's quite a lot already out there. You know, GW has produced an awful lot of of, of missions already. So, you know, you might be there writing your own missions, uh, spending hours and hours on these things, but quite a lot of stuff already exists either within the Horus Heresy community or within That's within nice. within. Yeah, Horsey. but I yeah, sorry. The, the the thing I would say is that if you are writing missions from scratch, you really do need to play test these missions because there are things that come up that you might not expect. Me and Lee were play testing a mission the other day that he was uh, for his event, and we could already see the moment our models were down that we needed to change a fundamental piece of uh, piece of the the terrain uh, that each player would put down. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't work. So. You need to predict uh, what is coming going to happen, and you, you can predict to some extent every eventuality. Uh, perhaps not every single one, though. But you you do need to predict what could happen in in different games and different armies playing those things. So, yeah, I, my advice would be see what's around before writing missions from scratch. Um, what's yeah. your your guys' thoughts on the missions? I think that the most underutilized source of really, really interesting missions are those that were included with the exemplary battles PDFs we got. Correct. I think 95% of the time, people just skip straight to the rules. <laughs> what, are you, what units have we got? Yeah. Like, what are what units have we got? Oh, fucking hell. Aren't Morlocks yeah. amazing? Oh, yeah. my God. Isn't this thing really shit? Christ Almighty! Now the sun's got fucked over again. Um, no, no, no. That's all we were fucking here, right? But actually, if you read through the missions, they're really, really interesting missions to play. Yeah. And I think that with a, a bit of a brief rewrite of the story, you can you you could you could play. A, you know, there are like a dozen really genuinely interesting missions. I reckon no more than twenty people in the entire world have bothered to play at any point. I mean, I'm not saying pass them off as your own, but what I am saying is, like, give them a go, play them at your gaming group, yeah. rewrite the the backstory to it, and um, yeah, you don't need to constantly reinvent the wheel. Like, yeah. if that if that's the thing that's really putting you off running an event because you're not necessarily sure you're going to be able to create an interesting mission pack, then just take it from elsewhere. Great, great idea, Adam. What's your thoughts on mission writing? Um, I think I think. Um... It's good to see what's out there. Agree and and appropriate from those missions as well. Take yeah. what take the elements that you like um, out of there, whether they be narrative or the deployment type or the way the objectives work, for example, and design around that. Um, I think that having a progressive scoring element to your missions is also quite important. Yes. Um, yeah. And and what you want to do essentially is. With your missions, you want to encourage um, engaging play. I think that's the most important element, right? So you, what you don't want is people going, well, if, if I have a look at this mission here, I can just stay in my deployment zone with my shooty list and score all the points. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of not what you want to encourage. You want healthy board movement, engagement of, of units, both in shooting and in combat. You want lots of territory being taken across the board or force players to move into territory in order to score points. Yeah. Um, because that makes for really interesting gameplay. 
mm-hmm. and that's generally where most of the fun is had because mm-hmm. no one just likes being leaf blown off the board, right? Yeah, um, yeah, by, that's something, by, that's um, something to consider. Healthy board movement. I haven't really considered that, or at least put it into those words. But I think that's a a good point about a good mission. You know, you want to be moving around constantly, not just battering the shit. Out and 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 have and have variety too. So so not all objectives need to be kill points or yeah. have a kill point element involved. Um, mm-hmm. There can be you know end game parameters as well. Yeah, that you can add in there, um, and also changing up secondaries as well is also a good idea. Yeah, definitely agree. Awesome. Uh, let's have a look at the next uh, next bit, John. So uh, we we are really drawing close to the end. So one thing I would say um, about any event that you run is you need to bring it. You need somebody who a good friend who will step in uh, for you in case you have a player drop out. Now it's fine if you have two players drop out. Ideally there's one from the traitor side and one from the loyalist side that you can you can do. Um and and that works well but basically I think that it's nearly it it makes it very difficult trying to organize all the victory points, all the best sporting, all the awards uh in between uh um in between the actual games and then play yourself. And I had to play one game and I um, at the event that I just run last and I was already stressed in that third game because I was like, fuck, I need to do this, this and this. Luckily, somebody dropped out by the fourth game so I didn't need to play. Um, unlucky for them, lucky for me. Um, but you you need a ringer. You need a good friend who can stand in and it's happy to play either loyalist yeah. or loyalist or traitor. <laughs> almost inevitable that someone's going to drop out at the last minute. Yeah. Or just not turn up at all. As uh, I think, I think as a blanket rule, EOs should just expect a 10% attrition rate yeah. before the event starts yeah. um, to, to get, to get a sort of more realistic representation of numbers. You always lose 10% no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Or so, thereabouts, right? Yeah. Make sure. You so have- it's important to have those contingencies in place. I find like ringers, um, I, I generally good for people helping out on the day, whether that's mm-hmm. like helping out just with admin, handing out score sheets or whatever, or if they're yeah. just there like to watch for half a day. Yeah. Um, um, uh, it's good to have just a spare army with you as an EO um, that anyone can just pick up and play. And even yeah. if they're there for the day or they claim, oh, I don't really know the rules. I just like come to watch or whatever. They end up having the time of their lives anyway when yeah. they go in and play a game. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's a win. Make sure you get a good friend to, to support you with that one. Let's have a look at what's next. So, um, Armies on Parade and Best Sport. I have talked at length about my thoughts on Best Sport, but um, what about you guys? How do you I... organise a vote for Armies on Parade and Best Sport? Well, obviously, as we know, Rob, I was the originator of the I think it should be favourite army. Yes. So it should be the army that you would most covet, the army that you would most like to remove from its owner and take back with you at your own personal possession. Indeed. And I think that is by far and away the best metric because it's entirely subjective. I don't I don't like mm. best painted because I think that um it encourages you to think like technically this one might be the best painted, but I like this one. Yeah. But technically this one is better painted, so I should vote for that one. Well, I like this one. Yeah. And um, I, yeah, like I said, my preferred metric is always, I like this one, so I'm going to vote for this one. It's my favourite army. Yeah. Um, best sports, everyone should be best sports. If anything, you should have a worst player experience and then ban that player from attending future events. <laughs> what a way to do it. What a way. Yeah, <laughs> naturally <laughs> assume that you're not a dickhead. <laughs> yeah. that's a good way to do it uh adam how do you run these things over uh at your events and 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 in ours yeah i do i do i do um a, a first uh first second and third for for peers vote mm-hmm. so their favorite favorite army essentially and that comes under like a, a player's choice um award yeah. and then i give out a um an eo's uh, choice first and runner up as well. So I think that yeah, um, the 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 EO's choice is generally like the 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 more sort of coveted one uh, mm-hmm. I'd say, and the um, the the peer voted one is the the players attendees favorite army. 
Awesome. Um, I think both work. Both work just fine. Yeah. 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 So there's lots of ways to do it. I my only piece of advice to people is um, I would have a ranking system. So for best army, I think that so th- this is what can happen, especially around best sport, is that if you have one vote per person, is that one person or sorry, five people will get like two votes, right? And then yeah. as yeah. Neo, you have to arbitrarily decide who gets it. Yeah. Now that never had made me feel comfortable. Um, spoke to us, Callum, uh, a good friend of ours, um, and he said, well, just do it as points. Basically, you ask yep. people what their best game is and then their second best, you give that best person three points, the second best one point, and then that will separate very quickly the person is best sport and i use that for armies on parade as well so i asked people to rank it first second and third i did three points you get three two one right and then yeah that, that's how i do it as well yeah. that created the kind of the fairest uh system i thought uh ranking yep. it that way um, and it'll give you enough spread too right correct yeah and i felt confident that i did and i i, I did not at any point need to arbitrarily decide who got the award uh, because of that and that made yeah. me feel much more comfortable about the the experience so like it cool all Good. right let's have a look at the next bit so <laughs> yeah this is interesting right so other awards now uh paul got all of the best sport but he also got the wooden spoon i think people quite liked having a wooden spoon award um because it kind of softened the blow and having the most amount of prizes associated with a wooden spoon um, I think mm. that people were kind of like, whoa, I should just take a really shit list basically next time. They generally get a new bag of dice, don't they? <laughs> wooden spooners. <laughs> I think people walked away with, I think Paul walked Did away Paul with. Paul get a Land Raider like, for being worse. Paul got a Land Raider, he got Contemptor, he got, he got yeah, but it's the wooden spoon is the best prize. If you I'll want pray for Paul, I'll pray for Paul. <laughs> and a thousand sons. I mean, um, I've literally never heard of Paul, so. <laughs> um, but um, what's your thoughts on any other awards? So I, I I do top VP on loyalist and track side because it really spurs those. But I know that it causes some people anxiety um, doing that. But have you guys done any other kinds of awards previously? Um, I've done a even though even though it's generally frowned upon at a narrative event, I, I give away a best best trader general, mm-hmm. um, which is my yeah um, um, world breaker award. Yeah. and um and best loyalist general um as well yeah just for just for players who um have racked up the most victory points over the weekend yeah. however i kind of soften that blow a little bit by by giving that award less prize support agreed yes, um, that's exactly because that's not the main focus of the event right you're not here to yeah we're not here to like you know punch people's dicks in or anything like yeah, that. That's, that's, a good, that's, a good, that's a very good way to kind of like knock it back, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, like and, and, and what I do want to champion is, is, is hobby and, and sportsmanship and that sort of stuff. So for example, like the, the most coveted award would be like the EO's choice, right? So that has the most prize support. And then you kind of, you kind of tier the prizes, you know, in, in that sort of way. Yes. At the last event, I also, because there was just so much good hobby um, on display as well, I just gave out minor prizes for things like coolest dreadnought or walker, coolest yeah. vehicle, coolest unit, all that sort of stuff as well. Um, and and um, it's a good way to 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 share the awards as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a and, good and that's I generally, really generally have a rule where um, you know one person who's won a major prize can't win can't win anything else too. So I'll just give it to the next best person in line. So let's say the same person's taken out general, EO's yeah. choice, and best sports. <laughs> Yeah, right? I I give them to the three three other three. That's a good, that's a good way to good way to do it. I mean, Paul really did deserve both awards. Really, he had a terrible time at the weekend, but I think that's probably a, a good way to a good way to do it. Um, John, any other thoughts on? on I that? really like the idea of like best moment, but it's such an odd metric, isn't yeah. it? Like, and unfortunately, yeah. like, it's- I, like I have, I genuinely have been to events where you've had. Four great games against four great people, an awesome weekend, and nothing of interest has happened. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, or someone has had something pretty arbitrary happen to them, but they're quite a good orator, and therefore yeah. they've been able to convince someone that it was the the coolest thing in the entire world. <laughs> you just thought, oh, it's just smacks a try. It, beca- it becomes obviously, uh, obviously it becomes I'm, 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 arbitrary, I'm right? pseudo calling out Tonka here, but um, but also at the same time, I love you, Tonka. Um, <laughs> But you are a tryhard. 
Um, <laughs> I, no. I really genuinely love the idea, but I think the reality is, yeah. um, oh, uh, truth be told, I think the way that genuinely, I think the way that you've done prizes with Actium has been really, really good. There's prizes for being good. There's prizes for being shit. There's prizes for being nice. There are prizes for being good at hobby. There are prizes for being cool at hobby. Not necessarily yeah. good, but like doing something different. Yeah. Um, and um, also you get free shit just for turning up. Yeah. Like truth be told, honestly, I don't, I don't, I genuinely don't think, um, I don't think you could do it better than we do it. So there you go. Oh yeah. Uh, um, and then one final thing I would say is that yep. if you want to do price sport, yeah, your option is that you take some cash out of your kitty, whatever tickets those you've got, mm. or you look for um, uh, sponsors. So, um, yeah, yeah, we are lucky uh, to have lots of connections um, with uh, people that we've created over the years and people that we know, local gaming stores. Um, SM Battle Reports approached us. Um, we've got a friend, Alex, who does 3D printing. I met Dan through... Um, uh, who's Gator 3D? I met Dan through a painting course. Like lots of these connections that you make, and, and you will have those connections as well. Um, uh, but the but it's about tapping those up, I think, and just you know asking nicely. Um, but you know, not not begging, but asking asking nicely. And, and we are so lucky to get the support. The price yeah, we we are particularly we are so lucky. Yeah. Um, we, we know we are, but um, you know. But if you don't have those connections necessarily, you know, an Age of Darkness box will go very far, right? If you just want to buy that and then, you know, give the rule book to the wooden spoon person and then everything yeah. else to all the other people, you know, tie it up in a nice bow or something like that. And, you know, it will go far. Yeah, so. it never it never hurts. It never hurts to ask, right? Yeah. No, um, as, long as, you, as long as you ask politely and in, in the right manner. Yeah. But it all it also can be like a hey you can scratch my back I'll scratch your type of scenario too so if you can if you can you know um, sponsor me with a, you know a box of goodies for example I can win you more business by just yeah. slipping a five ten percent off voucher in everyone's goodie bag or oh, something like 100%, that. hundred percent right? right. I remember after the first Actium event, like we had a, a discount code for Archie's Forge for bits and bobs. That Archie sorted out mm. for us. Oh, and spent loads of money. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and and I, I bet Archie's already paid back the box he's given away, yeah. and then some, right? And then so some. yeah, that's Just how these sorts my of order things. Alone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Right, let's have a look at the uh, the next one. So ticket price. This is an interesting one. Um, I'm not sure that we could probably have. You know, I think we, this we... is. I genuinely, Rob. I think this is such a contentious topic. Yeah. I think that I think that you need to be realistic because yes. and, and as well that you've got to bear in mind that your circumstances, like yeah. just because I can afford to spend 65, 70 pounds to go away for a ticket and then travel in hotels and food and beer, and then I'll normally build and paint a new unit or a fucking army to go to an event with, right? Like that I'm in a fortunate position, uh, hypothetically. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like other people are. So I think we, I think it's that you've got to be reasonable about your your ticket choice, ticket price. Like you want to make sure it's covering all of your costs. Well, yeah. we've discussed that might be a a longer topic. Um, but you need, yeah, people are. I think generally there's a difference between price and value and something that costs a lot of money does not necessarily mean it is bad value. In fact, some things that cost a lot of money can be very good value. So you've got to be careful about where, like thinking about, like, I think that the, what we offer with our events is very, very good value, especially when you need to take into account the price support, the venue, the, um, the quality of the terrain, the fact that the missions and the production go into it as well. Um, and all of the, 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 the goodie bag stuff that you kind of get right i think there's there's an awful lot of value in there but i would say we're probably sort of more towards the the higher end of things yeah. um whereas if you look at some events um like you know 50 pounds is probably i would say the sort of median kind of yeah. cost for a weekend yeah. event ticket um i would happily if i knew i was going to a great event 30k frontier for instance i think that ticket was 65 70 quid worth yeah. every penny every penny yeah. i would have paid i would in retrospect i would have paid more even more yeah um but also at the same time like i remember the first um 
weekender that um that we did and i think i ended up spending nearly 100 quid on the tickets for the yeah. weekend yeah. and i did think at the time i was like i said to andy like i didn't think it offered particularly good value and i think that was feedback he received quite a lot and he was he addressed that and you know well i'm going to i've been to everyone so far i'm going to the next yeah. one in next month so yeah yeah exactly. that tells you everything i think yeah. yeah, yeah, essentially, essentially, what they're buying is value, right? Yeah, hundred percent. And 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 the value is generated by you as the event organizer. So yeah. I think you just have to find that right balance of, um, you know, where where value meets price, right? Yeah. yeah. If you've got if you've got a shit hot venue, good looking terrain, a really interesting, engaging mission pack, you've invested time in in putting together a good immersive event for people to come and join in. You've got decent prizes. Don't be afraid to ask for a premium ticket price, yeah, but at the same correct. time, don't like don't undersell yourself. But also at the same time, yep. if it's maybe your first one and the venue is a little bit basic and the terrain is a little bit basic, and there's no, there's not, it's not to say that it's bad, but maybe a little bit more basic, and you've cobbled together a bit of money for some sort of prize support or something then also at the same time, you've got to be realistic about what people are going to be prepared to pay. You would much rather, especially for the first one, slightly err on the side of caution and charge maybe a little bit less and people give you the feedback of going, oh, this is a really good event. I'd happily pay a little bit more than overcharging and people going, no, I'm not going back to that. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, some good points there. Really, really well put uh... Adam and John there. Thanks so much. Right. There you go. Excellent. Right. Let's have a look at our next one. This, this mate, it's, it. it's a nice, important yeah. slide. So, um, I mean, that what a great discussion. Uh, whether you are an attendee or whether you are somebody who's looking to put on events, you know, loads think, of people. Food I would before we before we kind of get into the role of honor. I'd just like yeah. to spend maybe two or three minutes. If you are and have you've never been to an event before? And I know we did touch this when we talked about um, our event and um, the Author's Hope event in the last main show we did last week. Um, but like, events are really, really fun. Like, I would never have met Rob had I not started to go to events. I never would have met Adam had I not met people that knew Adam and kind of got involved in the event scene. Like, it feels like I think that when you kind of listen to some of the podcasts that it feels like the same sort of 12 to 20 people going to every single event that sort of monopolize it. Right. Um, but realistically, it's a, such a good way of, of kind of broadening your horizons when it comes to playing games. Um, and I've got such a, a wealth of people who I, I like, I cannot wait to see when we get to an event. And that's just because I kind of took the plunge to go to my first one. And, um, and yeah, it, it's just been such a, a broadening of horizons. So my especially advice now, is, John, when there's with the new edition, there's been such an in- injection of new blood into the into the scene as well, right? You want to get out there and meet these people. But also, there are so yeah. many events. Like you know, I, I think it would it's it's the easiest thing in the world to go to one event a month right now. You can go to a great event every month, but that also means as well, like, but it's not always particularly accessible. Like if you live in, like I do in the Southwest, we don't have that many events. Like there's always going to be a bit of travel. So like, you know, I'm quite keen to put on a local event at some point this year and it'd probably be quite small um, just because obviously getting all of our terrain and tables and stuff down is would be a ball lake. So I'd probably look to provide stuff locally. But um but just to kind of sort of bring bring a few people together, if we can get like 10, 12 people together in, in a room for a couple of days, absolutely fantastic. But also at the same time, like if you can get to a greetings weekend there where there are like 80, 90, 100 guys playing games for the weekend, plus all of the other stuff that kind of is associated with that particular event, like you should, you should, you should go. Like, you know, you'll you'll meet some great yeah. people and have a great time. If you if you if you've never been to an event before, too, I just yeah, em- employ it a, you know. Get, get a mate along if you don't want to go alone and just yeah. put yourself out there. Don't don't have any grand expectations of, you know, no. what the what or preconceived notions of what, what it's going to be like, or what who the people are or or how well you want to be doing or anything like that. Just go uh, with an open mind and and have heaps of fun and I'm sure the bug will bite and you want to go to another one straight away. One, the only one piece of advice I will definitely give you is if you're, uh, as someone who spends a lot of time um sort of or fair amount of time working away and staying in hotels and the like is uh, take your own pillow 
Trust me. On this one. <laughs> Trust very, me. Uh, very wise uh, advice there. Right, yeah. uh, roll of honor. So I'm still learning how to do this. There were people on yesterday's roll of honor who were not here on today's, and I think it's because Patreon uh, messed up. But I think this is the correct list now. So we have WH Black Panzer, Craig the Celt, Nicholas Drax, Andrew G, that guy Laza, Sagan Sadler, Chris Levitt, Julian, Mark Ainsworth, Dale Barrett, The Old World, Death of Heresy, Kerry Love, Alex Robinson, Tom Spear, Hammer and Nailsfoot K, Richard Harris, Cathonic Waterby, Simon Whitehouse, Peter King, Ashley Bowley, Pete Day, Al, Randy Oberland, Edgar Povolotsky, Bradley Stutz, Patrick Greenstreet, Cody Silverstone, Mike Dorset Wolf, Richard Willis, Tom Hayward, Neil Afton, Ben Robinson, Watercook the Fourth, Ben Ide, Gorko, Lupercalia, EX, John McArdle, and Thomas Silverstrand. Thank you ever so much, guys. We really, really appreciate all of our Patreons, but particularly our Praetor level. Well, also worth bearing in mind as well, if you want a very easy way to run an event, all of the Heresy Hunter <laughs> events, yes. all, all of the packs that we produce, all of the missions that get ridden, ridden, written, um, the new and old tactical objective cards for um, escalating points uh, can be found on the Patreon for free. Well, not for free, obviously. You want your money. And you've got to pay for them. Of course. Uh, but you can... We are making them available to patrons. So it's just three quid a month to join the Patreon. You get all of the event resources and you get twice and a bit as much Heresy Hammer with two extra shows and other bits and bobs going on. So patreon.com forward slash Heresy Hammer. And I believe at the time of recording, we are on 99 patrons. So will you have the honor of being the 100th patron? (laughs) How are you guys going to celebrate? Uh, uh, we haven't started yet. We were talking about that prior to the show. We're, we're still, uh, we, uh, we've got like four shows for a weekend. week. So. Busy, yeah. busy. Right, let's well, finish going, it off. I'm, yeah, exactly. Let's do this. So, uh, are you doing it? Or shall I do it? No, you do, you do, you do it. it. I forgot what I was doing. Are you sure? I'll do it. Okay. Uh, don't forget to use hashtag Heresy Hammer. We want to see all your amazing work. Don't forget to like and subscribe, comment and share this video. We really, really uh, appreciate uh, the, the comments, the shares you give us. Uh, if your nan hasn't seen it, make sure your nan sees this video. Uh, if you've got a list you want us to have a look at, send it over at heresyhammer30k at gmail.com. And don't forget, as we said, the Patreon. It's £3 a month. It's a bargain. You get so much heresy content every month on it and all of our back uh, backlog of heresy content as well. But also, particularly thank you to Adam. Adam, your your thoughts around painting and gaming have been so insightful uh, oh, today what a hero no uh, problem my pleasure guys thanks i've, for asking I've learned that. just so much from listening to it and i think it we would love to have you on again but um, i think definitely yeah but let's have for, a new a new patreon here which gives you yeah yeah yeah, 50 pounds that, yeah. A month. um particularly i want to have a look at a hobby kind of focused heresy hammer i think that would be absolutely awesome so yeah, yeah. i'm down excellent sure. all right awesome so it's a goodbye from me goodbye and it's a goodbye from adam <laughs> bye-bye <laughs> Take care, guys, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.